I think we can just wait a few minutes. Uh, one, one minute. Okay, uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday. Uh, on behalf of Team Kalpa, I welcome you all to Kalpa's fourth Growing Up in Science event. Today, our guest is Professor Sunil Mukhi. Before, I, before we introduce him, I would like to tell you about what this talk series is all about. Growing Up in Science is an effort to bring to light the hidden human factors behind working in science and academia, which are not usually talked about. Often when we see highly successful people, we talk only about their achievements in intellect, but not about their personal journeys, including certain doubts, struggles or failures that everyone faces. We believe that providing a platform for people to share a behind the scenes view of their career will foster a culture of openness about everyone's personal issues and also bring the ICER Pune community together in some sense. So today's session is going to be somewhere between a talk and a fireside chat with audience interactions. If you wish to unmute and ask a question yourself, please raise your hand and we'll call on you. You can also type your question in the chat box and we'll try to ask, you at the, ask it at the right time. Please refrain from asking scientific questions. There are better avenues for them. And if you have any advice related questions, keep them towards the end of the session. Moreover, it is our sincere request that everyone keeps their videos on. Let's make it different from an online class, which frankly we've had enough of. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to Satwik will introduce Professor Mukhi. Hello. As most of you might already know, uh, Dr. Sunil Mukhi is a professor of physics here at uh, ISA Pune. He obtained his PhD from Stony Brook University in theoretical physics, following which he held a postdoctoral position at the International Center for Theoretical Physics. Subsequently, he was a faculty me uh, member at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research for 27 years before finally moving to ISA Pune in 2012. That was his official story, but we've all gathered here today to listen to the unofficial one. So with that, I welcome once again, Professor Sunil Mukhi. Thank you, Satvik. Uh, would you like me to start now? Yeah. yeah. Um, Great. Well, um, I'll start. So thank you all for coming here. It's a, and it's a real pleasure, especially like to thank the first 10 people who I can see their videos and uh, that makes me feel that I'm not talking to a blank wall. Uh, I can tell you that for me, <clears throat> Zoom, the Zoom era is not really that much of a problem because at least I have reasonable net connectivity and reasonable, I mean, for many years I've been using uh, Skype and other things, but uh, talking to a blank screen where everybody's name is visible, that's no fun. That's the only thing. Now, I know many of you uh, are at home and there you may or may not have good connectivity. So I understand. So, But if you're in ISA campus, then at least please do unmute your videos. Hmm? Second thing is please feel free to, um, oh gosh, I can see Ritwik. I was going to tell stories about my fifth year students. So how embarrassing. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, please feel free to interrupt uh, at any time, literally, because this is not a seminar. It's not a lecture. Uh, by my nature, I tend to talk uh, a lot, but uh, I like being interrupted. And especially when I'm not talking physics, there's no reason to finish any sentence which I've started. So, so you, you, you make it very informal. Okay, I made some notes for this talk just to help myself and uh, I understood a few things uh, about myself, which I probably didn't realize. And uh, they'll keep coming up as themes. Uh, so I don't think I had, a, you know, I had many good things going for me, but I don't think I had an easy time in my career uniformly. It was uh, very much uh, like sine wave type of things, you know, just when things were going well, they would go badly. Just when things were going badly, they would again go well. Uh, a few times, I think at least two or three times in the early years, my career nearly sank completely. And I'll tell you about that. Um, okay. First, you know, I'd like to start by saying that there were a couple of childhood inspirations, which probably helped me get interested in science. 
and um, they came from my brother mainly and uh, it's particularly nice as well as sad because uh, he passed away one month ago only uh, he was many years older than nine years older than me but still quite youthful and sadly he is no more anyway um when i was in the fifth standard i think as a joke he and another cousin both older than me thought that they'll show me uh, linear simultaneous equations and how to solve them and see whether i can do it they said look this kid brick gets good marks in math so let's try so they did and i picked up the rules i won't say i deeply understood what was going on but uh, i didn't have a problem to understand what is x and y in an equation something you have to find out by some means and they showed me the standard way to solve it and i did a few and then uh, they were very pleased and very proud and i was also pleased because you know i was uh, really in fifth standard so i must have been what um gosh now i can't calculate but anyway it must have been 9 or 8 or something 9 so it was very nice and it felt good but uh, i would say there was something else my brother told me once which stuck with me and i i would consider that perhaps more uh, impactful and that is uh, there was a day in our you know in in bombay i grew up in mumbai and uh, it's a very humid city so in particularly in those days you know in every monsoon the doors would jam like suddenly you can't get into the bathroom or the bedroom or you can't lock the door it has just swelled up and jammed and one time i think i was just pushing the door trying to get it open and he said look that's not how you do it there's something called scientific method first you find out which part of the door is jamming is it at the top the bottom which corner you look at it closely and see what's happened then you put your fist on that particular place and give a light blow smart blow and it opens and ever since then i have applied that philosophy to like opening a, a jammed bottle or opening anything um and uh, somehow that scientific method though it was such a trivial problem and not even a science problem you could call it an engineering problem but okay it's still science that stuck in my mind so these were little things that i think uh, helped me be excited about science as a child and by the time i was in 9th or 10th standard the science teachers in our, my school they were pretty good i'll say i would say better than the ones i had in college and some of them were really quite inspiring and um, and um, yeah i did well and so again it was encouraging and it felt nice uh, but there was one teacher i'd like to talk about uh, his name is derek disuza uh, i don't even know if he's alive or not he was a maths teacher young very young maths teacher in my school and he had a very um, strange uh, job with us Uh, the thing is we were in some year when the syllabus had changed in such a way that you could take higher maths by the way that those years it was 11th standard it was the 11 plus 4 not 10 plus 2 plus 3 system so you could take higher maths if you were take doing science or you could take biology or you could take both they suddenly introduced that you can take both now for whatever reason i didn't want to do biology of course i regret it now a lot uh, but uh, i think frog i think frogs and uh, they, that was what freaked me out i just was you, you had to dissect frogs and there was no way i was ever going to dissect a frog and i have still never dissected a frog thankfully although i now i realize it probably interesting uh, to do it uh, and now probably you don't even have to do it probably you do some virtual things and all but whatever it is so so i was in a batch which opted for the high so the the biology people if they didn't take higher maths they got lower maths less advanced hmm but the maths people if they didn't take biology there was no class for them there's nothing for them to do in that period every day and the school authorities got little crazy because there were only eight of us like that hmm? die hard we are going to do maths and we are not going to do biology so seven or eight of us so they said okay let's invent a new uh, out of syllabus course called modern mathematics which has no um, there no board exam in that just uh, we'll have one teacher who is there anyway and will keep them entertained teach whatever he feels like as long as it's under modern maths so this guy derek disuza young smart fellow comes into class every day 
lights his cigarette. Those were the days. By the way, please, I'm not endorsing cigarettes, but uh, teachers used to smoke while teaching. And also, we didn't have a classroom. We had just a, a, a big wooden table. So we just sat around the table. And then he'll talk about whatever he wants to. And this is now I'm talking of 10th standard, probably. And he started talking about groups and group theory. It was so much fun. And he showed us how to derive groups by, for example, take a hexagon, cut it out of paper, cardboard, then flip it, reflect it, rotate it, see all the ways you can map it to itself. That's the symmetry group. Then uh, identity. He knew some, I mean, he knew quite a bit of formal maths. Like he was one of the really well educated teachers we had in school, and there were many and flip it and all that and then derive the rules and suddenly we knew this group theory and the best part was that we didn't have to know it we didn't have any exam he gave us some exam but again the exam was not anything serious it didn't count for anything and maybe that was great because we got that feeling that now we can just learn for the fun of it that was one period in a in a, in a day when we were just learning for the pure fun of it and we really um, uh, we, we really had a lot of fun with that course, uh, group theory and many other things. And um, well, just to keep it light, I'll tell you one little uh, personal story. Um, after I graduated from school and I went to college, I turned 18 and then I started to smoke. Okay, again, I, I'm not advising. At that time, the health uh, hazards were not known, I can assure you. And I went back to school to visit Derek D'Souza specifically. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, come, come. Let's sit in the teacher's room. And I sat there and he pulled out his cigarette and he said, would you like one? And I said, sure. And I was so pleased that like now I'm going to smoke in front of my teacher because I'm an adult. And so I took it and there was a fan above our head. So I tried once, match went out. I tried twice, the match went out. Tried three times. And then he looked at me and said, you haven't been smoking very long, it looks like. So like in front of the one teacher who I really admired made complete fool of myself. But, uh, but anyway, and I never saw him again. I don't know, maybe I should have tried harder to keep up with my teachers. Uh, there were other good teachers, but I don't have time to go into it. But this person did really something. He gave us uh, some inspiration. And uh, yeah, then, um, okay, I can pause if you have any comments or questions anytime. Okay, maybe it's too early in the game. There were other good teachers. We had good teachers for physics, for chemistry. And so I was quite drawn to science. We had, frankly, we did not have good teachers for geography, history, literature. I mean, the subjects were good, the books were good, but the teachers were mainly asking us to mug up stuff. But for physics, we had teachers who actually would derive things that we found thrilling. And the chemistry also, they would explain why some reaction happens and all that was really something imp impressive. So moving on to college, I went to Xavier's College in Bombay also. And uh, again, you know, it is where my brother went and it was just where everyone goes, at least among people I knew. And there, there was a priest, a Jesuit priest, a Spanish priest actually, and he taught algebra. And this was one crazy guy. He was really passionate about algebra. And he had one person that he hated passionately. That was the universe, Bombay University professor in charge of setting the board exams. He just hated him. He just thought he was a fool. It was like some mathematics rivalry. That person was a professor in Elphinstone College. And this person, Father Common, was a professor in Xavier's College. And these are two close by colleges in Mumbai and rivals of each other. But that person got to set the board exams. Common, Father Common did not get to set the board exams. And that person, according to Common, would set stupid questions, questions with wrong answers. And then he would stand in the class and in his Spanish accent, he would rant about this person. You know, what does he think he knows? Look at this question in the board exam. Does it make any sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me. It was, uh, it, you know, what I, what, why it made an impact on me. There's somebody who really feels about the subject. He's not teaching it for the sake of uh, teaching, uh, but for, because he really is passionate and really cares. And he gave us his own typed notes, which was not an easy thing to do in those days. I don't know how many of you know how typed notes were copied in 1974. 
Uh, have you heard of this uh, technique uh, called uh, cyclo style? No, you haven't. I've so the type, huh? I've seen it in a TV show. TV show, okay. Where, where they had a blackout and they were using this weird thing. You had to spin with a lot of force to hmm. copy. So you have a wax a sheet, which is a wax sheet, and you get a typist to type your notes. Or if you can type, then you type the notes. Um, and those uh, when you type that uh, the typewriter thing makes some kind of cuts on the wax sheet so it's like it types it on the wax but with some cuts then you spread um, uh, what do you do you you in some way you roll it through some machine which inks it so the ink goes into those cuts where the typewriter head has hit the wax and then it goes over paper repeatedly and transfers the image to the paper Okay, so that's the cyclo styling process, and those were the notes. Quite hard to read, actually. But the Father Common gave us his own notes. I also had a, another priest in school, another Spanish priest in school, Father Casale, who, of all things, taught us Indian culture. That was he refused to call it history. He said, "I'm teaching you Indian culture," and he said, "Look, what I know, I've not learned from books. I go on weekends with some basic archaeology tools." all around the country and I dig and that's how I know. I find coins, I find artifacts and that's how I know uh, Indian culture. He even told us what's the definition of culture, which you don't find in many books, his definition of culture. The, the sum total of all the thoughts, ideas, opinions on how to run a society and how to organize a society, something. He had a very nice paragraph on that. That's a different priest. Anyway, I was I was lucky to be taught by three very exceptional priests uh, from Spain. Uh, anyway, Father Comin, the mathematics teacher, was uh, was great. So that was inspiring. Physics teachers, some of them were okay, but on balance, uh, can't say much about the physics or the chemistry uh, teaching. But anyway, got through it, and uh, it wasn't difficult. It also was there wasn't much content in the syllabus, frankly. Um, so, you know, by the time I was through three years of BSc, it was nothing like what you people have been exposed to in three years uh, of BSc. So, well, but Xavier's was a good college in the sense it was in a very central part of town, very well exposed to the world outside. And, you know, it was very vibrant. We used to hear stuff, we used to read books, we used to see people would bring books and share them. Uh, loan books to each other and various science books, non-science books, fiction books, music, records. So it was culturally very, very rich experience and it really made a big, a big difference. And then I went to Stony Brook for my PhD. And here um, things uh, went both ways, let's just say. So I was really young. I went after a BSc. Uh, very few places in US were admitting after BSc without an MSc, but Stony Brook was one of them. And so I ended up there. And uh, uh, I, I have a question. Yeah, Sorry, I have a question. Um, so you said that in St. Xavier's that your max teachers were really good. So then why would you do a PhD in physics if ah, your physics teachers weren't exceptional, but your math teachers were I know. exceptional? I, I'll tell you, I would have done maths, actually. Again, it's partly my brother. He told me you can't get a job if you do maths. <laughs> <laughs> that was already one scary thing. And the second was uh, that I did have some friends who were doing physics, BS, BSc, and they were very passionate. I didn't mention them. Um, two, three friends who I had... Uh, in the class who were uh, passionate about physics. And when the choices came, they were very, you know, positive about physics. They, and they used to, they knew about people like Feynman. One of them actually, his father was a TIFR professor. So he even knew about Stephen Hawking. We are talking of 1975, you know, he told me there's brilliant guy in Cambridge called Hawking, but he has some speech uh, disorder and he, he can't talk properly. So this is 1975, this is before Hawking wrote his famous Hawking radiation paper, but he was already a legend by that time. So these friends, I think that sir, was- I have one more question. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, like how did you after directly after BAC get it to Stony Brook? It is, because, because it is a very selective school, right? And it's now very it difficult. Is, now it is. In those days, uh, Stony Brook actually was very clever. You see, Stony Brook is a state university and state universities have a different uh, philosophy from private universities. Private universities in the US are like Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, Chicago, Caltech. 
they have a top quality undergrads who pay a lot of money and then top quality PhD students. The state universities have very average undergrads, many of whom don't pay anything. Like if you're from the state, you basically don't have to pay or you pay very little. And basically in that state, like Stony Brook, if you pass your high school in uh, that part of New York state, you can get admitted to Stony Brook, no further exam required. So the undergrad student body was very mixed. It ranged from the very good to the very poor. The PhD student body was very good, was really very good. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I went there, but um, you see, they had a slight image problem because they could not, you, those universities, Berkeley is another one, University of California system is like that. Uh, state universities have an image problem because even PhD students think, ah, it won't be that good as, as, as a private university. So Stony Brook actually took advantage of that and um, uh, was hiring students. They figured out that students from India are very good and doing well. And somehow before me, they had uh, two very well-known people, uh, Mustansir Barma, who was my colleague in TIFR uh, for many years, and uh, Rohini Godbole, who's still a very good friend of mine and who's in ISC. Both had already been at Stony Brook. And somehow it had become a thing that, you know, they trusted the Indian community to, and they trusted the letters of reference from India. Now, uh, I heard later that in places like Princeton, if you only had letters of reference from India, there was no way you would get in. And actually, um, the first Indian I know who got into Princeton with full support was Atish Dabolkar, who is now the uh, director of ICTP in Trieste. Uh, and this is 1985 we are talking about, so we're much later. Till that time, there was no way to get into Princeton from India. You had to, either you had to go to US with your parents if they migrated to US and then through some other school transfer and all that. Basically, all of this political correctness was not there and India didn't have that image of a knowledge superpower and blah, blah. So or IT power and everything. So you couldn't get admission to those places being in India. They simply weren't interested in considering the possibility. Hmm. So, and in fact, I heard bizarre things about India. You know, I don't know how many of you have heard of Jeffrey Goldstone. Uh, he is the discoverer of the famous Goldstone mechanism or Goldstone boson, which plays a role both in particle physics and condensed matter physics. In 1987, I met him in MIT and he said, you know, I have this Indian student and he wants a job in India, but is it really possible to do research in India? And he's asking me in 1987, Okay, which is long ago for you, but Tiafar was already a reputed institute by that time, very reputed. I mean, Homi Bhava had been dead almost 20 years by that time. And still in the US, they had no idea that it's possible to do research in India. So there was that level of ignorance and MIT again is a private and very high status university. So, you know, there was that kind of thing and Stony Brook just somehow took a gamble on us. And in the end, uh, you know, there were 150 students across all disciplines of Stony Brook doing PhD in those years that I was there. Engineering, chemistry, maths, physics, and many of them I still know. I mean, I have friends who did biology, came back to India, I have friends who didn't come back to India, but they're still in, settled in US. Many physics I can name like a whole lot. Chanda Jog is a professor in ISC Bangalore. Um, uh, Nilima Gupte, professor in IIT Madras. We are all on the verge of retiring now, but pe these people are uh, yeah, there. And um, I don't know, uh, Durga Das Kasbekar, he was, is, I think, director of the Center for Digital Fingerprinting, CDFD in uh, Hyderabad. He's a biologist. And, you know, just it's an endless list, and many people of whom have gone, Ashok Sen, of course, uh, and Somati Rao, uh, so went to HRI and are now in ICTS. Yeah. So that's how, yeah, that's how it worked. Okay. So let me get back to the, unless you have more questions, I'll get back to the narrative. I'll have to drop many stories. I have many good stories. Anyway. When did you know yeah. go to the US? Sorry? When did you know you wanted to go to the US? Well, it was a thing that people tried for. I didn't really feel that I have to go, but, you know, I thought it would be nice to go. And so I tried and I got in and uh, I was shocked that they actually were going to pay me. I mean, uh, 
uh, a, a teaching assistantship, which was then $300 per month from which you had to manage food as well as a hostel room. Uh, and hostel room was $90, so that left. I remember those figures very well. We had literally like no spare penny and it was almost impossible A, for any parents in India, even well off to afford any foreign exchange secondly to get permission to send foreign exchange so i simply didn't take any money from my parents ever in uh, after i left so i lived on that so it was pretty tough but uh, yeah i just tried and i got it and i went you know your generation has to think about you know what do i want what do i really want to do in life i keep getting told by people i'm thinking i'm i'm going to take a year off to think what i really want to do in life you know i i laugh at that of course you should i don't say you shouldn't but uh, you know that's not how life works like you can think for a year how what you want to do in life and you still won't necessarily get the right answer or you can jump in and uh, randomly you will reach somewhere where you want it to reach it, I, I have a lot of belief in uh, in jumping in and then seeing where the tide takes you and which way you want to swim. Okay, but Stony Brook was tough. I mean, the first thing I noticed was that, you know, there were these uh, two people I mentioned, Rohini and Chanda Jok, both at ISC Bangalore. Um, when I met them, you know, they were from familiar places. Chanda was from Bombay, Rohini was from Pune. We could talk, we could communicate, we could, uh, you know, cook food and invite each other and all that. And they were very encouraging to me. Chanda was my batchmate, but Rohini was a senior. And when I told her, you know, I think I might not clear the comprehensive exam, she said, no, no, you'll get a distinction. And uh, she was almost right. I actually got the highest marks that year, but they didn't give me a distinction because I got um, unbalanced marks in three papers. The total was still highest, but uh, one of the papers went bit worse than the other two. Anyway, so it wasn't a distinction, but she was right, I did fine. But there were American colleagues, and I don't want to say that Americans are bad. In fact, they had many good American friends, but they had a certain competitive spirit, so they would never encourage you. So I remember telling one American, I wonder if I'll pass the comprehensives, and he said, yeah, well, maybe you won't. So I, I'd never seen such a thing. Like, you never, you don't know people who will tell you that, right? Just put, just to, put you down a little bit. And uh, literally, there were all sorts of people who would show off no end. And actually, Chanda and I and Alok, one more batchmate, three of us were like struggling to, you know, cope up with class and new system, new life, new hostel, new everything. And we had these friends who dressed smartly, they had cars, even as PhD students, and they um looked so confident and then the mid-semester exam of the first semester came this is phd course and they all flunked it and we we got like uh you know high grades like a and the 90 percent and all and we just looked at each other and we were like these people who have been showing off for last two months don't know anything really we just couldn't believe it i mean we were like totally naive that, you know, if they're showing off, probably they're super smart. They knew a lot of buzzwords. They had read a lot of things. You know, there was this guy who used to talk of airy functions and Hilbert space and all kinds of stuff that, and Banach space and things that frightened us. But in the end, they couldn't deliver. And actually, yeah, it, it, it was quite a lesson. Anyway, moving on, I got my PhD advisor of choice. That was a tough one because he... Uh, he had three students wanting to join him and he gave us all a paper to read and said, uh, I think there's an error in it. It was a paper from Russia in those days, a big deal somehow. And uh, see if you can find whether it's wrong or right. And if it's wrong, then what's the right answer? It actually was the first paper on supersymmetry by a Russian uh, pair called Gelfand and Lichtman. And so he said, you're not allowed to talk to anybody about it. You just have to work on this yourself. This is a problem in quantum field theory to work out the details of this paper. But I remember I tried and struggled in my office. And I, you know, once or twice I cried because I just couldn't figure it out. I didn't know the notation. I couldn't ask anybody. I was not allowed to talk to any other student or faculty. And it was like two, three months I had to just do this. But in the end, I somehow got through. These were the times when you know I felt I was sinking, but somehow by not sinking, I got through. And I found that the paper was actually wrong. There was a crucial error. Um, conceptually, it was okay, but there was a crucial technical error in the result. 
and then i uh, then i went to the advisor and showed him what was wrong and then he was very happy and then he said okay now you do this this and correct it then he said now you generalize this system so i did that and that became my first paper in 1979 and so that was a great feeling and uh, the other two students who were competing did not make it so again uh, it was a case of me thinking they were smart but in the end, somehow they actually won't. Yeah, um, but then came a big blow, two blows actually. So this advisor gave me a problem to work on for the PhD thesis, and it was a research paper and a calculation, which for those who do physics, it's called a two-loop beta function. Um, it's tough. Uh, it's a tough calculation. He gave me, there I, he was helping me, and there was another PhD student also working together, but this particular calculation was mine and nobody, uh, I mean, the others were just participating, but I had to do it. And there was a prediction that the answer of a long calculation adding up many, many terms should be zero. The advisor thought it should be zero. And I didn't get zero. I, in fact, got at the very end of like 10 pages of calculation, which I was doing day and night, day and night, uh, I got two terms, which were uh, the same thing, uh, quantity, but one of them was plus half and the other was minus one with a co coefficient. So plus half minus one adds up to minus half and not zero. So I showed it to him and he said, no, look, this can't be right. You have lost a factor of two somewhere. Either your plus half should be plus one or your minus one should be minus half and then your terms will add up to zero and then your answer will be right. So I really struggled. And again, it was very lonely because not really by that time you know this is a technical problem i couldn't even ask anybody for help it was my research problem and he was you know seeing me in his office but not really offering much help uh, or trying to get involved and it was my it was clear that it was my calculation and the one person who really kept me going was ashok sen who was that time uh, in the next hostel room across the corridor right in front of my door and I still remember one time I had to meet this advisor at nine in the morning. And normally I used to sleep at four in the morning and so and wake up at 11 or 12. But uh, I had to meet him at nine. And uh, I was trying the previous night to get this factor of half. And finally at four, I couldn't take it. And I said, I'm going to sleep. Now, Ashok had different timings. He used to sleep at 8 p.m. and get up at three and then do his work. Everybody had their own crazy timings. And uh, I think he figured that nothing much is happening between eight and three, except people partying in the corridors of the hostel. So that's the time that he'll sleep. And once he's up at three, it's very quiet in the hostel, so he can really work. So I told Ashok before that, I said, look, if I'm asleep when you wake up at three, uh, you know, around five, can you wake me up? And I slept at four and one hour later, there was Ashok standing there with a cup of coffee and I struggled out of bed and then again, uh, you know, tried to do what I could and see the advisor, but no luck, no factor of two, no factor of half um, came out. And then one day I had to ask my advisor about summer. You may know that when you're paid in the US, and by the way, the ones who are going like Ritwik and Shabri, uh, may know that may not know that your payment is for nine months. You don't get any money for summer three months. So if you want summer money, you have to separately ask for it, and then that's a separate payment from a separate grant. Of course, if they are nice, they'll do it, but uh, it's separate. Even faculty in US don't get paid for summer. They get paid nine months, and then three months of summer they get either paid from their grant if they have a grant, or they can travel and get paid from somewhere else. So I, but you know, from being an Indian, you can't just live in US for three months in summer. What do you eat? I mean, how do you eat? So I told him I need this funds for summer. And he looked at me very coldly and said, we don't give summer money to students who can't find factors of two. And so I, I think that was the single worst day of my life. So, you know, so here is that this is the level of pressure and there was no Twitter or anything where, you know, everybody is saying, yeah, PhD life sucks and students are facing mental health issues and all. I'm glad for you. I'm glad it's there, but it wasn't there at that time. And um, well, it's funny what happened next. So what happened next is that he got a job in MIT math department and moved out from Stony Brook and left me behind. 
and said, I think you should work with a different advisor, but don't worry, we'll write up the calculations as a paper. And so he moved and I said, but I'd like to come with you to MIT then, can you not take me along? And uh, there was another student uh, at the same time. He took that other student and he did not take me and he said, no, MIT doesn't have funds for you. You stay in Stony Brook and work on a different topic with a different advisor. This is after, you know, I'm in my fourth year or third year and I have two more years and then there's no money. And I've in, by this time I've done this calculation for months, except that I apparently got the wrong answer. Well, then something happened. He went to Europe to give a seminar on some related work. And he talked about this prediction that this quantity is zero. And uh, somebody in the audience there put up his hand and said, uh, have you checked this particular aspect of your argument? Uh, because if there's a loophole there, then maybe the answer can be non-zero, but there has to be a specific kind of term. It has to be a specific tensor structure. And he came back to the US, but not with me, but worked with the other student. And they figured out that the term I was finding, which was not canceling, was supposed to be there. And it was exactly that tensor structure, which uh, was allowed. The only one which was allowed, that was what I had found. And my calculation was right. So by this, and we wrote up the paper, it's a three author paper, but I did all the calculations and they actually didn't even check the calculation really. They only checked that the calculation is consistent with some prediction, which earlier they thought it's zero. Now they realized it need not be zero. And uh, nobody particularly apologized to me, but at least the paper got written. This was my second paper. And today it is my highest cited paper with more than 500 citations is one of the, yeah, it's my, my highest and it's, uh, you know, 500 is considered a lot. In fact, it became famous unexpectedly about three, four years later in some other context. So uh, this is where I nearly drowned. And uh, by now I was with another advisor. So I had to actually change field and quickly write one more paper and then write some hodgepodge PhD thesis, which was half on that and half on this. And I didn't enjoy that at all. Anyway. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I thought I'd highlight the bad times because some of them, I think now I realize I could have really, I could have sunk and uh, I would thank, you know, let me, let's be very blunt. All my Indian friends in Stony Brook, I've named a few, um, you know, Ashok Chanda, Rohini, Nilima, many more, many more. I mean, who I may not have stayed close to now. Uh, Utpal is another one. Uh, uh, many who left the field, many who are in the field but they were all in the hostel and we stuck by each other. And you could go to anybody at midnight and cry to them and uh, you know they would sort of sympathize, make tea for you or coffee and they might have a donut in their room, then you would eat their donut and it really helped. I mean, really, really helped and nothing like it, okay? And I also remembered, it's very funny because you know I went to America thinking, I'm not going to America to meet more Indians. We have plenty of Indians in India. I will meet, you know, all kinds of people from all over the world. And I did. But finally, the ones who saved my life were the Indians. That's a fact. You know, it is the fact. And again, I had many good and still have a few friends from those days. I still talk with them sometimes on the phone. Some are in Australia, some are in different places. But, um, but the Indian, Indian community gave a sense of support, which without which I would have sunk, for sure. I think I would have gone nuts. Of course, at home, you know, family was trying to help, but you know, family, what can family in India do? They can write you a letter and it reaches you 10 days later. Then you write them a letter and it reaches them 10 days later. So, you know, if you are in need of emotional support, uh, you can write a letter and get the support 10 days, 20 days later. But uh, I didn't see it's not quite the same thing at all. Okay. But, but uh, okay, so these were the bad things in, about Stony Brook too. But the other good things were, you know, learning to cook, living away from home. It had a very active cinema club. I saw a lot of rock music concerts there in the campus, in the lecture rooms in the evening. There would be, this was 1970s. So for those of you who like rock music, it was only nine years after Woodstock, seven years after Woodstock. Actually, it was a heyday of everybody was still around and all kinds of things were happening. And that was fantastic. And if it wasn't in Stony Brook, you could always hop on a train and go to New York City two hours away 
and so I saw concerts in Madison Square Garden and venues like that. Um, and that was something else. I mean, that was great. Plus, of course, I had uh, I used to play sitar and I had taken my sitar with me and I used to play there. That also helped me a lot to keep me sane and going. And we had a good music group in the Indian uh, cultural circle and we would do Diwali concert. I, I even performed one Diwali and um, my picture came in the local newspaper and all that. So a lot of cute stuff happened. So nothing to regret. Anyway, after all that, I, uh, I somehow wanted to leave the US. I wanted to come back to India, not right away, but I wanted to leave the US. There's something, there was uh, also some a level of racism which was bothering me. Of course, other people didn't bother, and uh, but I was just hypersensitive. And so when I got an offer of a postdoc in ICTP Trieste, I took it. And Abdus Salam was then the director of ICTP Trieste. And he was, uh, so I was basically his postdoc. But it didn't go very well. I mean, again, I worked with him. And uh, what I managed to do in the time I worked with him was to prove one of his older papers completely wrong. I seemed to be good at that. So, and he agreed with me, he said, yeah, it's wrong. Of course, Salam was that kind of person. He wrote lots of papers, some were brilliant, some were wrong. He didn't really care. He didn't have too much of, um, I mean, he was one of those who just kept putting, he was very creative and kept putting ideas out. I thought he was a good guy. He was very nice to me and he was, it was nice to see him and you know, just have him around, but okay. So again, I was lost. And those two years were another struggle because now I had changed my field and I didn't know whether I should change back to my previous field or continue in my new field, tried out the new field, which was uh, quantum chromodynamics QCD and didn't really get any inspiration. And there were not many faculty in ICTP. It was not a great place to be, frankly, uh, physics wise. So it was a uh, huge lack of mentorship and huge lack of success for nearly two years. And if it had gone on one more year, my career would have sunk once more. But luckily in that second year, I you know, put in extra effort and I met a PhD student there, um, who a, an Italian. We became friends and started working on something. And there was a professor, uh, Italian professor who used to come to ICTP often and we talked to him and we got an interesting paper. And after that, uh, my Italian friend and I, Camilo and I, we wrote three more papers that year. And suddenly things started looking up really looking up a lot. They were beautiful papers. I still like them a lot. And they were done by young people, basically with very, very minimal mentorship. And then in 1983, uh, Witten came to ICTP to give lectures in the summer school. And that was such an inspiration and a thrill. And so uh, got to meet him, got, and he came to tell us that, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, what was the excitement about string theory, basically, that was when he informed us that there was excitement about a subject, which we had literally never heard about. So that was a thrill. And then I applied to TIFR uh, to, uh, to go there as a postdoc. Now, you know, nobody that you know, has come back from abroad to India as a postdoc. If you're a postdoc abroad, you come back to India as a faculty member. But in those days, first of all, I wanted to go to TIFR. It was in Bombay. My family was in Bombay. I just wanted to be there. And it was a beautiful place. I had been there and seen the sea view from there. And I said, I have to be there. So I wrote to them for a postdoc. And first they said, no position. Then they said, maybe position. Then they said, yes, there's a position. Come. So I finally went there. And that was a tough two years again. By this time, I had a bunch of papers. So I was doing well. But again, once I was there, I had no particular mentorship and I had to struggle to figure out what to work on. And this has been my pattern. It's not an easy life. Every few years, I suddenly find that I'm out of ideas and I have to again struggle to get some new ideas and work on something. Uh, but there's a lesson in it, of course, for all of you, which is don't give up. I don't know how I did that, but I did somehow. And I, again, I thank you know, family and friends. So it was a tough period, but in two years, they actually confirmed me as a faculty member. Now, TFR was a place with some strange features, one of which was some very cutthroat competition. And people really- Sir, how old were you by this time? By this time, I was 20, this was 1984 when I joined TFR. So I was 28. 
I got my PhD a little early by the age of 25 because of this that time, coming out from an IMSC were there. Uh, yes, IMSC was there, and in fact, interestingly, while I was a postdoc in TIFR, uh, Professor Raj Shekharan at IMSC, without actually knowing that much about me, I think he saw me in one conference. He sent me an offer of a faculty position without me applying. There was something quite uh, I was quite touched by that. And then, you know, as I said, in TIFR, there was a bit of unhealthy competition. And so one or two people were like, yeah, yeah, you have this offer, you must go. And I said, I'll go, but only if TIFR doesn't give me an offer. And they haven't said anything yet. So I'll wait and take my chances. What happened in TIFR was that the very senior people really liked me and they were very supportive. People closer to my age group were competitive and bit cutthroat. And it wasn't nice at all. It was actually quite horrible. I mean... I never understood how people can try to cut your throat when you are a peer of theirs. I mean, you are their age or close to their age. Uh, you're not trying to do anything to them. You're not trying to get rid of them, but they're trying to get rid of you. I didn't understand it. And it left me quite shaken for many years. And I don't want to go into more details who it was or what happened, but it's a very, very sore story for two years. Even People, you know, I trusted them. And so I told them even my whole uh, horror story of my PhD and all that. And then they used that against me and went around telling people, oh, this guy, he just wrote one major paper in his PhD and it took him so many years and all that. He's not that good. Or, you know, a lot of things. But the senior people, they really uh, trusted me. And today I spoke on the phone with one of them. His name is Probi Roy. He's retired and living in Calcutta. He's 80. And I spoke to him today. And we were just like, yeah, I mean, we were, you know, it was great being colleagues of each other in uh, TIFR all those years. So, yeah. So that was the plus. And then good things started to happen. So a student called Samir Mathur wanted to move from astrophysics to physics. He was actually an Arlikar student. And so I taught him string theory. He had finished his PhD early and he was just hanging around. He had finished a very good PhD in astrophysics about Chandrasekhar's work on collapse of stars. He had written it all himself. He was formerly student of Jayant Narlikar. And he said, no, now I'm spending, going to spend next two years learning string theory. So I taught him and we wrote papers together. And then Ashok Sen joined. Ashok had been my old friend and he joined TIFR and was allocated to the same office as me. So we were two of us sharing an office for a few years. And Samir, being a student, would come to that office and three of us would collaborate all day, like till midnight, every day. And that year, 1988, we wrote, I think, five, four papers. I've never written more than four or five papers in a year in my life. But that was a great year and those papers were great. And they actually, they sank, but they came back. They are back now and people are talking about that work again, which is very nice. It was a great experience. And, you know, some of the things I can just quickly tell you. Ashok brought back with him the first PC in the group, personal computer. He brought an IBM PC, a box like that, and um, you know those L, uh, LED screen, I guess. So what is the screen where it's all uh, black? CRT, and, huh? CRT, right? CRT. Yeah, it was CRT, of course. But it didn't have a, it didn't have a digit. It was not a, a teletypewriter. Yeah, not a teletypewriter. It was a screen, but um, there's a word for it. Later we got graphics. Huh? It didn't have graphics. It just had text. You could only. Oh, it was a terminal. It was a terminal. Well, it wasn't a terminal because the computer was there. Terminal is meant to be remote. Oh, CL, right. So, basically. so it was just a, a, a non-graphic screen and a computer. And it could run tech, which is the forerunner. LaTeX hadn't even been invented. And we taught ourselves tech. Ashok already knew some. And some, uh, Samir and I uh, didn't know any. No, we, had not, we had, didn't have a computer to use. So Ashok actually taught us uh, a lot about tech. Then we learned it from books. And then we would type. And you know, if, uh, in those days, in, on that computer, once you finish uh, editing your file, you have to close it and then you have to type tech and file name. And then there's a long silence and then the computer opens a square bracket and types one and closes the square bracket. Then after another minute or so, it opens another square bracket and types two and closes that square bracket. And this goes on for 15 minutes. And at that time, you have a paper of maybe 20 or 30 pages processed. 
and now you have to uh, now there was no viewer because it wasn't a graphics terminal so the only way you can read what it has processed which was a, a, a dvi file and then could be converted to postscript pdf also not invented uh, only way you could read it was to print it on a dot matrix printer which conveniently ashok had also brought your department didn't have anything and so we had we were the possessors of both the computer and the printer and uh, the printer had a rough mode where it would print quite fast but uh, you know not very clearly or a final mode where it would overwrite every line 20 times and it took a long time so anyway in that situation we learned how to tech uh, papers and we had lots of fun really lots of fun it was such a that was those were the best days some of the really best days and then when we finally wrote, I think it was our first paper together, three of us, it was like 70 or 80 pages, a really long paper. I'd never written such a long paper. And when we decided it's ready to submit, we gave the final print command and we gave it at around 8 p.m. And then we went down to the canteen for dinner. Canteen in TIFR is on the ground floor of the same build, main building. We came back after dinner and it had printed three pages or four pages. Hmm maybe five pages. And so it went on going, kr, 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 kr. then every you know, a few minutes, one page will come. There was a roll of paper. So it became two in the morning and that was my bedtime. And I said, guys, I can't stay awake anymore. They said, no, no, we'll be here. I said, why don't we pause the printing and resume it in the morning? They said, no, no, we'll be here. It's okay. So I went to the hostel and I went to bed. I had uh, not hostel. I was staying in a in a flat. I mean, in the campus, TFR campus, across the road. So I went there. I slept, and I came back at uh, nine in the morning. And they were still standing there, and the printer was still going. Kr, kr, but it had printed by that time seventy five pages. They had not moved from there. In TFR, you could not even get tea or coffee in middle of the night. So, well, we had breakfast and finally we had, and then we had to print it again because you needed to submit two copies uh, or three copies in a, in, a, in a big envelope and send it uh, by post or courier in those days. I think courier might have just started, speed post, I think had just started. So those were the joys of those days. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, this is quite off topic, but it's okay. I think it's, it's okay, right? I mean, is this okay? You want me to get this to the end? This is beautiful, sir. I love yeah. <laughs> that you're okay. so one, yes. I must tell you one story, and I think I still tell Ashok this story. So one, you, there was a thing called a floppy disk. A floppy disk was a disk this big, about uh, seven inches across, I think, in diameter. And it was floppy, literally. It was like, uh, you know, what is the best? Uh, and have you, any of you seen such a thing? Uh, yes. 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 We have. So it's not that other, young. <laughs> the later floppy was three and a half inch or three and a quarter, but it came inside a plastic box, so it was not floppy. Oh. But the okay, seven no, inch disc was I actually floppy, seen. and the consistency was like wax paper, sort of. Okay. If you imagine plastic, you know the plastic binders in which you put your loose leaf papers. That plastic, it, but it was black and it was that consistency, and it was a circular thing. You had to insert it into a slot. Close the, there was a handle in front, close that to lock it in the slot, and then it would whir inside. And that, <laughs> those discs had a capacity, you won't believe, of 240 kilobytes. Until uh, the high density ones came out, and those had 1.2 megabytes. So that was as big a file as you could write. But the early PCs didn't even have a hard disk, you had to do everything with floppies. But uh, Ashok had a hard disk. Maybe it had a few megabytes. I don't know how many. So one day Ashok came to me and said, you know, I had put a floppy in the drive and it's gone. So I said, what do you mean gone? He said, it's not there anymore. I said, it can't go anywhere. It's in the drive. So he said, look, come and look. So I looked and I op opened that lock and, you know, a little part of it would be poking out because if you wanted to remove it, you just pinch that and pull it out. So that was not there. So I looked and looked, we shone a torch light and there's no sign of it. I said, Ashok, you must, you're absent-minded. You must have taken it out and uh, lost it somewhere. He said, yeah, I guess so. Three weeks passed, a month passed. We never found that floppy. Luckily, it was not something that important. We never found it. And then one day the computer conked out and a maintenance person was called to fix it. So he came with a screwdriver and it was a horizontal box like that. So he unscrewed it and opened it. 
and when he opened it, we found the floppy inside the case. So what Ashok had done was he had inserted it in the gap between the top of the case and the body, which was just above the floppy drive uh, slot. He just maybe he wasn't looking and he just pushed it in and it went in the wrong gap and it vanished. And it was found sitting there a month later. So th those were all the amusing things of that time. Uh, anyway, okay. Now, uh, yeah, now in uh, 1990, I got an, uh, after all this collaboration sort of died its natural death because we had written many papers and that field had moved on. I got a, a post, uh, I got a, a sabbatical uh, invitation to CERN, which was really great because CERN pays very well and it's beautiful. It's in Geneva. You can live in a lovely place. You can have a car. You can see things. You can be in Switzerland and all that. But of course, it was a complete failure. All those things were there. The, the car, the house, the everything. I got my mother to come and visit. My father had passed away by that time, but my mother came and visited. My brother came. Lots of people came. Lots of friends came. Socially, it was great. But I couldn't get any physics ideas for the whole year. And with great difficulty, I wrote one paper in that year, and it wasn't a great paper. And uh, the head of the department wasn't even very happy with me. And so I came back very dejected. Of course, there's nothing much they could do. And they obviously haven't held it against me because I've been back many times and I'm again planning to go there next year. But um, I came back really dejected. So this was one of the down things. Uh, but when I, and when I came back though, uh, Ashok, uh, uh, uncharacteristically, you know, Ashok Sen is a very private person and he usually likes to work alone. But he just came to me when I was back and he said, uh, you know, uh, there are certain problems that uh, me and a couple of students are working on. We want you to get involved. So I said, sure, at least it would pick me up. And so we wrote a couple of papers and that brought me back. But I was still struggling for some ideas. And then in 91, I went to Turkey for a conference in December. And I met Kumran Wafa, who is a professor of physics in Harvard. Um, Iran, Iranian origin, a very lovely person. And he just, we just hit it off in conversation and all that. And I reported on the work I had done with Ashok, which nobody ever noticed after that, but at least in that conference, it went over very well. <coughs> and the next year, Wafa invited me to visit Harvard for a month. This I had never done in my Stony Brook days. I had literally not gone to Harvard University, which was hardly a few hours away. Because, you know, uh, just... You, well, I told you all that was happening with me in Stony Brook, so I never went anywhere. I literally never visited any U.S. university in the five years I was there. So here I was in Harvard, and uh, Wafa and I hit it off well, and as I said, he's a lovely person, and again, you know, I have many American friends, and I hope they don't watch this, but somehow people from the eastern part of the world, be it Iran or India, pretty much the same, there's a warmth and there's a caring thing which makes it much easier to hit it off with them. I just don't know what it is. But I instantly hit it off with him and we got to writing a paper. It took several months. I remember I came back to Bombay and there were riots. It was a bad year, 92 was a very bad year, you probably know. Uh, there, were, there were different kinds of riots at the time. There were riots in Bhivandi. There were riots for Babri Masjid demolition. There were, riot, there were bomb blasts in Bombay in 93. And there were more riots. And it was a horrible time. And from even TIFR, where we were sort of safe, we could see smoke rising in the distance. And it was... The, but, you know, Wafa, one thing about him, bless his soul, he's very obsessive. And by that time, we had email. Uh, so he was like, okay, what progress did you make since last night? So I said, well, there are riots going on in my city. And he said, yeah, OK, but what progress did you make since last night? So he's a bit like that. And I'm grateful. You know, some, you need somebody in the collaboration like that. So we made progress, and it was a nice paper. And suddenly, you know, all this competition I was facing in TIFR and unpleasantness, it started to die down. It was like, oh, Sunil knows people in Harvard now. Oh, so maybe, you know, maybe he's doing something. So there was that. I mean, it was like every time I was getting a little vindication, but mostly it was coming from outside. I mean, um, literally in the time I was working with Ashok, people were like, oh, he's just following Ashok. You know, it's easy for people to drive a wedge. I mean, Ashok never thought of it that way. And it, he was a superb collaborator and he's 
remains one of my dearest friends but you know people will always poke something or other and it will be your colleagues so so anyway so things improved and so couple of years i think on that wafa paper and i wrote few more and we, by that time there were phd students and we did some things and it was nice 92 93 those years were good 94 but again in 94 i again <laughs> felt a down down draft and by 95 i was uh, and exciting things were happening in string theory those are the years of duality in 94 i actually spent 3 months in paris where written gave a series of 10 lectures it was really thrilling on what is called cyber written theory for those who know and it was really thrilling but again i didn't have anybody with whom i could i was not somehow networking well with people that was my fault probably but in 95 something changed by 95 i had a phd student called keshav das gupta and in uh, late in 95 in around november witten wrote a very nice paper on something called m theory and it really tickled us and i me in particular and i was very excited by it i gave some informal journal club talks about it and then i told um, keshav you know let's try to look at this uh, this witten's um, <clears throat> work and so we were reading that paper and he used to work in the library because he liked the quiet over there on the ground, mezzanine floor of tfr and i was working in my office and then uh, you know uh, he would come up we would sit we would work and one day we had an idea for something new and the idea seemed to work very nicely and we hastily uh, wrote it up and put out a paper on the archive Uh, in retrospect bit half finished and not everything was right but it had a very good core idea and it was a totally new field for me i had never worked in this so called m theory or or even i mean this was like a, you know particularly formal aspect of string theory which even i had never worked on really directly and we put it on the archive and the next day i get i see in my mailbox a mail from edward witten and it says uh, dear sunil uh i saw your paper on the archive uh, it looks very nice uh, i've been working on similar things but you people got there first but if you don't mind i still want to finish my paper on the subject and i've sent you a draft if you could look at it and send me your comments and so i trembling literally i downloaded that draft and printed it and i looked at it and he had mentioned us by name das gupta and mukhi in six places in the paper in the text you know this 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 then he says of course these people had already anticipated this point then this 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 but as already anticipated by these people this thing and i just ran down steps to the library and i said keshav come up you have to see this of course that mail is lost now but all right uh <clears throat> those were not days of dropbox and so of course we were just i mean again it was one of those great thrills i mean you know the big boss has uh, has cited you okay but he has also appreciated you directly in detail everything what you did he has read everything he has of course a much better paper it's good that we he didn't put it first um but anyway uh, we did that and suddenly everything started to change including colleagues in tfr started being nicer and so many everybody just started being so nice about everything and you know it's a bitter lesson i'll tell you now i'm 65 you know in this country the day, we will progress on the day when we are not obsessed with foreign recognition but still it's true still we are obsessed there's no question about it we have much better reasons to be self sufficient academically i i don't say self sufficient means we don't interact with foreign people but we don't only sit and wait for people from there to appreciate and only believe that but right now it's not improved a lot it's still like that i may come to that at the end of my talk in maybe few minutes okay anyway uh, everything looked up from there on and i got invited to visit princeton the next year institute for advanced study that was a, a thrill uh, but even better keshav keshav and i wrote several papers and he was my first real phd student i mean before that i had co guided students with ashok uh they had been registered with him keshav was registered with me and today he is a professor in mcgill university in the physics department 
Um, but also, you know, we wrote two or three very good papers after that. And it was because he was absolutely cheerful guy. He just kept working and kept writing and kept showing me his calculations. And some days I was like, what is, what are you even doing? And he said, no, I read this paper and they did this. So I thought I'll generalize it. And I generalized it and something, something. And then I started to learn what he's done. So many of his papers, the idea just came from him. And I was like following like uh, almost like his student. And I would say it was his optimism above everything else. And so he wrote a bunch of papers. And then in 98, he applied for a postdoc. And guess what? He got it in IAS Princeton the best you can get in our field <clears throat> and so after that then i uh, visited harvard that year and i also dropped in on him in princeton and um, things went better and better and then in uh, uh, 2001 we organized the string theory conference that was another thrill strings 2001 my memory of that is we put a proposal a year earlier me uh, along with atish davolkar and spenta wadia Three of us were the conveners, and then we got all the rest of the Indian string theory community on board. And uh, we invited Witten, we invited David Gross, we invited a lot of Green and Schwartz, the inventors of string theory, so many top people. They all accepted because strings is the annual strings conference. So everybody accepts, and they had not been to India. And we invited Stephen Hawking. And again, I remember that day, six months before the, or four months before the event, we had given up. Uh, <coughs> hope of uh, him accepting, he had not replied. And then suddenly a mail came one day, which also didn't come to me or to any of the organizers. It came to some com computer account manager in TIFR. And it said literally this, it said, tell Sunil Mukhi that Stephen Hawking would like to attend Strings 2001. Again, why they picked my name out of the organizers, I don't know. And again, that mail is lost, but it was uh, quite something. And then of course, you can imagine it was such an event. It was like super glamorous. Uh, all the hotels were falling over us to host Hawking for free. And um, it was fun. We had everything going, uh, but there was, one, there was one very sad uh, downside, which is that, you know, since Hawking was coming, I was very keen and Spenta, Atish, all of us were very keen that TFR should start its private endowment activity where we appeal to industrialists to donate because TFR, you may not know, is not funded by Tatas at all. It's funded entirely by government of India and it has been for many decades, hmm. even though it's called Tata Institute. They only help to found it and they give some little grant, but it's not, I mean, everything, salaries, research, everything comes from Department of Atomic Energy. We thought, let's tap the industry people. But sadly, our senior faculty of TIFR and our director uh, let us down and didn't let us, you know, we could have done a lot, but they took over, you know, we had literally Taj Hotel giving a free banquet for Hawking and, you know, <clears throat> for 50 people from TIFR and 50 industrialists. Uh, <clears throat> including Ratan Tata, who is the chair of TIFR's uh, Board of Governors. And we had everything and somehow it never worked and we didn't get any uh, anything out of the industrialists for, uh, for TIFR's future, which I felt very sad. But it was the start of TIFR's endowment effort. It was again a case of, you know, everything working, but uh, somewhere some people let it down. And it wasn't us. Anyway, but that's the negative. Hawking came, he gave several talks. He loved coming, the, he loved the attention. He <coughs> came for the banquet in Oberoi Hotel. We had some, we all drank a lot and we had uh, Bollywood music play because all our foreign guests wanted to dance. So in the banquet hall of Oberoi, we were all dancing after the dinner. And Hawking had just, you know, with his wife, he had just driven his wheelchair out and he heard the music and came back. And he started driving his uh, wheelchair in circles with us to dance with us. Again, no video exists of that event, but you know, those were those days. So they are just there in our memory. But, uh, and also uh, his own, um, what birthday was it? Um, some birthday, you can look it up. This 2001 was celebrated uh, there at the hotel with uh, sparklers and a gigantic cake and everything. And, you know, he gave speech after speech and he was just a hilariously funny person and 
loved to entertain us. He would sit there, we would stand behind him, he would sit there doing this with his mouse, letters would form on that screen, then he would press play, then it will speak in that metallic voice. Um, and, uh, and then we would talk and then there would be five minutes silence and then he'll say something and like that. So yeah, that was a great time and it was a great time for the subject. Uh, but after 2002, yet again, uh, I discovered that things were going a bit downhill. And that period 2003 to seven, it's a little mixed. I mean, things were not going well research wise. I had a few papers, they were okay. I was not very happy. I graduated to PhD students, good people, they did good work. But I don't think I really, um, yeah, Bhushan. Uh, so, so Hawking would have been 60 the next year. So in this year he was 50, sorry, 70, uh, 60. Yeah, so this was his 59th birthday, I guess we celebrated in on 8th January 2001. Yeah. Anyway, so I graduated a couple of PhD students, they did well, uh, things were good, but things were not going great. I was not happy with my work. And then in 2008, again, when things were looking at their worst, uh, I had a postdoc, uh, Greek, Greek British postdoc called Kostis. Uh, so TIFR had a wonderful international postdoc program. Uh, we would get postdocs from, <clears throat> from Japan, from Europe. We had people from Denmark. We had people from Germany. We had people from Japan always. Like every year, we would have someone from Japan and Kostis from England. Sure. And as usual, the authorities messed up his visa. So for months, he was calling me and yelling at me, where is my visa? Why can't you start my position? Why can't I come to India and take, my, take up my postdoc? And I would be sorry, sorry, sorry. But finally... We got it and he came. And again, an optimistic person. And because of that, uh, we started working on something offbeat and we struck gold. I still remember that it was just one weekend working, doodling away some simple calculation. And suddenly we realized that something very big is happening. And we wrote a, quickly wrote up a paper and that uh, it's literally from start to, from idea to paper was seven days. That's happened to me before also with Keshav more than once with Keshav, actually. Uh, it all depends on the other person being very, very optimistic. Like never, just never knowing what it means to give up or just be negative. And so we wrote the paper and then uh, we didn't know how much impact it would make. But next week, somebody came out with a similar paper and suddenly that particular subject, which is again related to M theory, it just blew up and it became uh, the thing of that year. And uh, we just noticed our paper just kept getting noticed by everybody. And then I suddenly got invited to speak at Strings 2008, which was in Geneva at CERN. And uh, Paul Costis and I wrote four papers or three papers and they were all good. And this particular, the first one today has 275 citations. So it's my second highest cited paper. And again, it came at a time when I thought, you know, everything has dried up. I'm not getting any ideas and all that. So that was good. And those years were good, 2008, 9, 10. And by 2011, you guessed it, again, ran out of steam and enthusiasm. And I was actually a little gloomy. But luckily, uh, I had uh, proposed to organize a six-month workshop in Newton Institute, Isaac Newton Institute in, um, in uh, Cambridge on the strength of the work which I had done in 2008. Uh, with two other, two British colleagues. In fact, they suggested that I be one of the co-organizers and we got our proposal approved. So suddenly I found myself in Cambridge, England in January, 2012. And <clears throat> for the first three months, I was living in Trinity College because my good friend, David Tong, who you probably know who he is, uh, got me invited as a visiting fellow commoner of Trinity College. Visiting fellow commoner is uh, to distinguish from the, the, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge who are visiting fellow royalty. Uh, so <laughs> Britain is a very weird place, but a visiting fellow commoner, just to emphasize that you're not actually from the royal family, but uh, other than that, you belong to Trinity and you may know that uh, Trinity fellows are allowed to walk on the grass there. Nobody else is allowed to walk on the grass. So I was actually allowed to walk on the grass for three months. And I was given a key to a private garden where Hardy, I don't know who, which of you knows the mathematician G.H. Hardy, used to apparently work at a table overlooking the river. 
And so they did all these, all these very obscure customs, like giving me the key to that garden called the Fellows Garden and telling me that I'm entitled to eat at high table and drink their wine and go upstairs afterwards and have their pot wine. And uh, it was all bizarre. And you had to wear a suit for it. It was bizarre, but it was a good bizarre. I mean, quite good, actually. I got to see the uh, inside uh, story of British uh, British uh, elites. I mean, it's, it's, it's very funny because, you know, these were all, I met people who had been former cabinet ministers in the 50s and 60s and economists and historians and, uh, you know, a lot of intellectuals. But then all said and done, they were just uh, sad and drunk old men when I met them. So, you know, there was a kind of peculiar thing of seeing both sides of the good life. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the usual things, you go to the master's lodge and then uh, there's some chair where Newton sat and um, there's some book which Sonia Gandhi gifted to the royal family or something. And there's a picture of Amartya Sen and I met Amartya Sen. He's the, he was the former master of Trinity College. But uh, he came for dinner once and I met him and he really enjoyed uh, uh, meeting me because uh, he wanted to talk to somebody about Dhaka. You see, he, as a Bengali, he had just come from Dhaka back to Cambridge. And, you know, all the English people didn't care anything about Dhaka, but uh, Bhatya Sen was passionate about Bengal in all ways. And he wanted to talk about Dhaka. I wanted somebody who had at least heard of the city and I was the right person. So I was sitting next to him and he's talking for an hour about Dhaka. <clears throat> So those were the nice things that went very well. But then something terrible happened in, two, in uh, March. Before I finished my term in Trinity, I found that I cannot speak normally anymore. Uh, I, uh, my mouth was not moving normally. And so, you know, I thought it's some swelling, tongue, this, that. I went to British uh, Health Service, paid 60 pounds to meet a doctor for 10 minutes who said, uh, you know, put some, use some gargle or cough syrup or headache pill or this or that, nothing was working. And my speech was getting worse and worse. So it was like this, I, kind of the tongue hanging out. So I had no idea what's happening, but I knew one thing. I'm from Bombay and I'm going back there because there I can see doctors and I can afford them and they will tell me what is wrong. And so I came back. And um, first thing, went to see a doctor and he said, well, uh, I think I know what it is. It's uh, dystonia, which is an un, um, ununderstood illness where ne neurological disorder and we don't know why it comes. It sometimes goes away, but you know, you get a scan just in case there's a brain tumor, but I'm betting that there's no brain tumor. It's dystonia. So I got a scan thinking now I'm going to be dead in a few days and no brain tumor, nothing wrong anywhere. And it was dystonia. And nobody knows what causes it and nobody knows how to treat it. And so two months, three months of that, I went from doctor to doctor. Somehow nothing was happening. And third doctor I met, he was very good. He just looked at me and said, look, just live with it. Okay, you can be understood. You're not, your talking is not very clear or fluent, but you can be understood. Just live with it and try and, you know, it may go away. And if it doesn't go away, come back in a couple of months. So I said, you know, I still have a few months to spend in <coughs> Cambridge at uh, Newton Institute, that program was still going on. He said, go back, you know, dystonia in Bombay, dystonia in Cambridge, same thing, and it won't affect you, go back. So I went back, but I remember I was in tears. I, you know, I thought this is the end of my life. I can't speak normally. I love speaking, as you know, I've been speaking for one hour and 15 minutes. So I went back and the weirdest thing happened, you know, two days, three days, I was miserable, sad, alone. Then as usual, and I, I didn't know this was going to be the theme of my talk, but as usual, gang of Indians, Indian friends was there in Cambridge. Who were they? Samir Murthy is a professor in King's College, London. Rajesh Gopakumar, you probably know, director of ICTS. Mukund Vera, uh, Rangamani, uh, he's in uh, UC Davis, and his wife, Veronica Hubeni, also a scientist. She's not Indian, but uh, she's by family, she's, she's Indian also now. And uh, <clears throat> uh, maybe there was one more, I can't remember, five Indians. And I said, guys, I brought dosa mix from Bombay, some dry dosa mix. I'm going to make you dosas and prawn curry in my flat in Newton Institute. You come. So they came and I made it in the kitchen and they were sitting there and we were having some wine and talking. 
And I told them about this and they were like, yeah, that's very sad, but don't worry. It's not too bad. But it was, you know, I was stumbling every time I tried to speak. But otherwise I was okay. Uh, they were cool about it. Then they said, look, uh, we are going to invite you back. You invited us home for dinner. We are taking you to a Chinese restaurant on the weekend. So I said, great. So I went to a Chinese restaurant and it was some super spicy stuff. You know, it was a bowl this big with red chilies for two inches then oil and then some fish on top is something amazing. It's a Chinese thing. Okay. And so anyway, we tucked in, we had a great meal and somewhere at the end of it, Veronica actually from the other side of the table, she said, Sunil, you're talking more normally. I said, really? She said, yeah, I think so. I said, okay. And I just, after that, I didn't feel like talking, like not to try it out in case it wasn't true. And so we walked back a long distance to Newton Institute. I went to bed. Next morning, I woke up and tried out and I was talking normally. And I've talked normally ever since then. So mysterious illness, it came and it went. Yeah, it's really wow. I mean, during the time I had it, colleagues were like, Sunil, now you must write books. You can't teach anymore. You can't really do anything anymore. You sit in one place and write books, you get used to this life and all that. But um, wasn't necessary as it turns out. And I'm very grateful to that doctor who basically said, you know, treat it lightly with a light hand. It may go away on its own and it just did. It's crazy. Okay. And that was the year I joined ISER 2012. So I'm really coming to the end of the story. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, scary seeing as Hawking had a degenerative illness. Yeah, debilitating illness at the same place. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> lovely comments. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Meeting with, yeah. Meeting with new people and interacting has always been the start of things getting better. I completely agree with you, uh, Agam. You're completely right. And uh, this happens again. So this theme will happen a few times more in the last few minutes of the talk. So I come, so I had told Professor Ganesh that I'll join ISER in November if I recover from this illness. Otherwise, I don't know because ISER is teaching and I don't want to teach when I can't talk normally. It was not going to happen. But by June, I was, by May, this thing went away, which had started in March. And by June, I knew that I'm okay. So I wrote to him and Shashi and I said, okay, I'm ready. Send me the offer. They sent me the offer. And I joined on November 1st, 2012. Okay, now, as you may have guessed, okay, so now at least I was very positive because, right, I'd recovered from this awful illness. And I'd also organized a workshop for six months in Newton Institute, which had gone very well. It was a lot of fun. And um, Hawking was still around. And in fact, um, but he wasn't very well health-wise. He recovered later, but in that period, he wasn't very well. They actually had a conference for his, now we're talking 2020, 2012, uh, so it was his 70th birthday. Uh, but it was a closed-door conference, and it was all a bit tricky. But anyway, all the people who were there for that, then we they came to Newton Institute, which is next door, basically. So, and I met him. I mean, I met him at some... Uh, party or something. He had deteriorated a lot and he could not talk very, very fast. He could talk much more slowly and he couldn't use the mouse anymore. Now he was working with eyeball, uh, eyeball uh, inputs into a, a visual device. So it was very, it was very slow and it was quite sad actually. Anyway, um, so height of all the, you know, recovery and all, I come to ISER and it was great because Pune, I did not know Pune and I really liked it right out right away i stayed in panchwati in a flat shashi was staying in the same flat for those of you who know who is ls shashi dara and they were very kind shashi and ganesh and isa was a you know was a party town in those days it was a different thing altogether every few weeks we had a conference or an event or something and then director's bungalow would be thrown open and we would go there or there would be a student something ganesh was great for he was great for many things by the way not only this but he was a great socializer and he loved to get together with people. And so every event that could be an event was an event, you know, just uh, anything that, and ISA had a lot of money that was crucial. 
it had a lot of money you may know that for the first convocation which was held one year late because parliament got late in approving the icer bill the students who had graduated in the first batch had already gone abroad many of them for their phd so they were abroad so they couldn't attend the convocation they actually paid their airfare to come back for the convocation okay and you know he thought in that grand scale and somehow the government uh, let him do all those kind of things and you know it may be symbolic it may today it might look wasteful but you know whatever it is we had a grand convocation in a tent because that lhc hadn't even been built and <clears throat> i mean that atmosphere of those years 2012 to 2015 was glorious there was you know i was given free hand to hire people i hired a lot of people in those years and we joined the large hadron collider the cms collaboration sort of dubey and seema sharma and i went to cern to talk to people there but mainly they did the job they wrote the proposal icer got unanimously admitted to the collaboration as a full member the first icer to do so and before i think any of the iisc and other institute only tifr before that and maybe punjab university a few in the north were members of this collaboration but none of the ii iix as they are called i think we were the first so that went well and uh, it was very optimistic time uh <clears throat> but there was a downside i didn't write any paper for two years after i joined iisc till 2014 or 15 i couldn't write any paper my mind was just elsewhere i was just doing other things but then i realized that you know you can't <clears throat> goof off because people will get you so uh by 2015 i was feeling bad i was feeling that i you know that imposter syndrome that i don't deserve to be a professor of physics if i can't write a paper for two years but and i didn't have a phd student and i didn't know what i wanted to work on this has always happened to me every few years i don't know what i want to work on and then i got a student called sagar lokhande and this guy was awesome you guessed it very positive uh totally out there very smart and um, he is from rural maharashtra came from a very conservative family but he had no problem he would sit in the corner front row at the side and he would ask questions in every seminar no matter what it is biology physics chemistry anything he will always ask a question sagar was always there with a the question <clears throat> and we wrote a paper and it really i mean for me and for him it was totally new stuff and it really required very hard work and squeezing out a result we weren't even sure of the result the referee didn't even love the paper at first sight in retrospect it's a good paper and it's correct but it went well sagar did well and sagar got admitted to amsterdam for his phd and i visited him later and found that while he was there he took over the department now the whole physics department of amsterdam university which is a very top department no longer could function without sagar sagar would organize the seminar sagar would organize the department lunches sagar would organize everything everybody was like where is sagar how can we start the meetings are where is sagar <clears throat> if any visitor came to give a seminar sagar had to go and talk to the visitor and welcome them and tell them what time the seminar was and all that this is a phd student he was just there and he wrote like six papers or seven papers <clears throat> uh during his phd with very good people and they've done very well so again things picked up and after that i got a string of fabulous master students and i'll I, i'll read out their names there was sagar then there was harsha then there was girish saikat lakshya rugved ramesh rahul palash vinay chabri and rithik two of them are right here in this uh, chat but this is the gang and all of them have done really well and all of them almost all of them uh, i managed to write papers with and it has been a uh, kind of a rebirth for me because it's a new model i have to teach a student something in their fourth year so that we can write hopefully write papers or do some research in fifth year and there's not enough time realistically okay in fact all my students who went on to do phd didn't write any paper for the first 2 3 years in most cases it takes that much time to germinate your phd work but i had to do something much faster in a field where frankly most of the time i don't know what i'm doing so i don't even know to tell students what they should be doing it's not a field where i can tell them do this 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 measurement or calculation and you'll have a paper it just doesn't i just can't do that so it's not like that 
that's whatever it is anyway i also had a phd student turmali she did pretty well and <clears throat> so then in 2018 it was a quiet summer and things were now i sir ran out of money around 2015 16 and from then i never felt very happy i always felt sad that what the institute could do it can't do basically that it's a one line thing institute has all the capability but if we don't get proper funding we are not going to get anywhere and what has happened is that iisc and iits old iits not new iits have you know minimum 50 years and in case of iisc more than 100 years i guess on their side and they have that many years decades worth of alumni and their alumni are rich anyway iit alumni are engineers mostly and they are all in california and they are sending millions of dollars to iit every year and so iit can weather the storm of no funds but icers are not like that we are still what are we only 14 15 years old and you know the idea that we would be financially self sufficient is just absurd it's just a bad joke and well because of that you know research slowed down research labs slowed down research funds slowed down mainly the experimentalists i saw one after another of people including people i hired just struggling just floundering uh, because you know that half crore or one crore they need they can't get i also saw not less than 10 really good people we offered who would have happily joined icer because of our you know being new and nice and uh, pune and uh, great campus and great students but they said no look isc we also have an offer from isc or iit and look let's face it they have much more money they are offering me a couple of crores right away why can what will i do with you who can give me 5 lakhs in my first year and i said yeah i would also advise you so they all went to their various places where they are all doing great but you know so we couldn't get the best faculty when we had the positions and we wanted them and we went through everything we could do to get them but we couldn't get them. so that's a sad Thing. so by 2018 you know i had sort of got <clears throat> used to that i guess and also in 2018 i think i finally quit being chair of uh, physics in early 2018 so the summer was nice and quiet and it was a hot summer and rahul and palash were doing a project with me on gravity but not yet fifth year so it wasn't high pressure and uh, we were talking about rock music which i have always loved though i have been more a indian classical music person but uh they were like yeah we have a band i think i had been called to judge that band for uh, Kar- previous karwa and of course they were very talented so i said sure can i come and watch so i went and watched and then they said actually we don't have a vocalist <coughs> so i said you know i have a voice like a foghorn and i have never sung but can i try They said, "Yeah, sure, try." So I tried, and it was awful. But they didn't, you know, right away throw me out. And they said, "No, no, let's keep trying." And we tried a few times, and I got better quite fast, actually. And uh, one of the band members, Simran, who's from Symbiosis, actually, she is Rahul's girlfriend. uh she um said uh, don't worry sir they all huh, they all call me sir in the band i said look we are in a band you can't call me sir and they said no we are going to call you sir anyway and then i learned something you know they called me sir but they didn't listen to anything if i said you know how about we do this song they were like no i said no they said no we are not going to do this i said okay okay you say so so it became clear who was the boss you know they were the band i was just jo- i had just joined and they were, they were going to call me sir but it was more like a joke I, i actually have no idea what they used to say about me behind my back but i think they had a lot of fun but it was clear in their mind that i am a valued member of the band but i should know my place and uh, decisions are taken by the band predominantly uh, rahul uh, and uh, akshay uh, the bass player akshay nair and uh, then palash uh, simran and uh, prasanna the drummer and i was kind of last in a way and i liked that in a way i thought it was nice i would go from my office in icer to the music room in the hostel and there i had to listen to them and do what they said if they said sing this i would sing this if they said you can't sing this i couldn't sing this so that was that and we got actually better rithvik was there one one time we actually banaud 
Sanjeev Galandi. I don't know how I had the cheek. We allowed him to give us lecture, the lecture hall on a Sunday morning just to practice. Apparently, it's never been done before and it's never been done again. Now there's some 20,000 rupees charge or something charged for it. Somehow, I don't know, those days uh, <clears throat> they had not figured it out and he kind of gave in in a weak moment. And Ritwik was there, I remember that. But I had fallen sick that time, so I sang even worse than usual, but there is a recording. And so like that, we got a bit better and better. And finally, we performed in Karva, which was a crazy thrill. As usual, you know, the recording is crap because whoever the professionals were who were called to record had paid a lot of money. They made a miserable record with recording with miserable quality and miserable sound. Uh, some of the mobile grabs are actually better. <clears throat> and of course, our performance was uh, strictly fair, uh, not great, but okay. But it was possible. It was fun. Whatever it is, it was fun. And uh, people had fun. And then I thought, you know, the band and I have another glorious couple of years ahead. So 2019, we kept practicing and I used to look forward to that. By then, I was you know, feeling that I need something to do in evenings, not just physics and getting older, you want some, you know, to be with people, but do something really fun. So I would head to the music room if they were going to be there and twice a week. And it was, it was day. I mean, I was never the one to refuse. I mean, they were like busy with a million other things. So, and there were five of them. So all had to agree, but anyway, we met many times. And uh, we got better and we had a good program and we planned something uh, in uh, April to be held in the amphitheater, which was built by then. And then, of course, in April, when it was baking hot, uh, at 7 p.m. on the dot, when we were about to start, a thunderstorm came. So we had to move to the LHC and perform in the lobby, and the sound was awful, and everything was awful, and it was an awful concert. Still, it was sort of semi-fun, but it was awful. Then we kept going, practicing, and then it became too hot. So amphitheater ruled out. Then we thought Karva. So Karva is in November 2019. But guess what? The monsoon didn't end that year. And it rained nonstop for 48 hours. So Karva, for people who remember that year, it was in, held in a swimming pool, practically. So we are uh, on the day of our performance, we were told that we can't perform. There's no slot because there's too much rain. So that was that. So we said, okay, now mind next year. And what did we know? You know, then I started telling, uh, oh yeah, the concert actually was called off twice in April. Once a uh, student, PhD student, I think drowned in a very tragic accident. And then we had to call it off. And next week the storm came and again, we had to call it off. And then in November there was rain. So again, we had to call it off. And I told people, I think, you know, somebody up there is trying to close down our band. And well, somebody up there had the brightest idea of all. So in May, in March 2020, when everyone was still here, uh, the pandemic came and that was the end of the band for good. Mm. So it was a case of, you know, one of those great things that was enjoyable and good and fun and happy and warm and it didn't last. And there's a lesson in that, which is that, you know, we should have practiced more on the days when it was there not knowing that it was not going to last. I mean, we should have realized it was not going to last. I learned a lot from that band experience. It really made me a different person. So every few years I've ended up as a different person. Uh, okay, uh, I'm done now and I'll just tell you three things and I'll stop and then we can still chat if you have energy. There were three dreams I had for ISER. <clears throat> the first was that young faculty should be we should be able to hire them with good funds to start up a lab and do front ranking work and then really bug them till they do that front ranking work. And the minister uh, of HRD, Javdekar, who took over from Smriti Irani, he came to ISER and uh, he gave what I thought was a fairly reasonable talk to us in the dining hall complex to the faculty and asked us what his ministry could do, uh, something we were not asked either before or since in recent times. And so I wrote him a letter saying that, you know, start, put up a grant, uh, create a grant, which will give, uh, you know, two crores allocated to an experimental science faculty up to two crores against a proposal, which is disbursed on the day that they join the job. And I said, call it Kickstarter grant. Well, three months later, 
he signed or six months later, he signed on it saying very good idea and forwarded it to all the directors of ISERS for further inputs. So everybody was all very thrilled. And so they gave all their inputs and then it went back to Delhi and then the minister changed and that was uh, whether minister would have done it or not, I don't know, but it never happened and there's no such thing. It just collapsed. And that was part of the sadness I have that, you know, every good thing we tried, you know, I cannot create money. That's one thing I'm not good at. I cannot, you know, if I had, uh, you know, 100 crores, maybe half of it I would give to Aisar Pune, but uh, maybe maybe 90 percent i don't really need uh, that anyway but i don't have that and you know money has to come from somewhere and if a country wants to grow it has to spend money on that growth so that was very sad and then you know people's research really started floundering uh, the second dream i had was to hire in diverse modern areas and there i was successful we branched out in quantum information we branched out in high energy physics we branched out in <clears throat> innovative areas of condensed matter physics. Uh, we got a lot of experimentalists, a few theorists, all are doing very well. It's a great department. I'm very happy about that. The third dream I had was to internationalize ISER. My hope was that we'll have 10% at least of our faculty be from abroad. But I mean abroad, I don't mean some Indian who has grown up in US and nostalgic to come back. Of course, also fine. But I mean, you know, people from Europe, from US, from Japan, from China, from Africa, from Arab countries, from Iran, you know, there are great scientists everywhere in the world. And I wanted to see a cross section here. And I can tell you that the US grew to be a science superpower because of that. It's extremely well known. Okay. And the US may have had political difficulty with lots of countries. They had a cold war with the Soviet Union. But if a Russian should manage to reach the US, they were very welcome. There was nothing like you come from Soviet Union, don't show your face over here. Even today, it has awful relations with Iran. But if an Iranian can actually get to the US, they're most welcome there and they fit in with the Iranian American community there. So the academics is a safe haven for people, no matter what country, culture, religion they come from. And I wanted India to grow like that and ISER to be the leader in that. And that was a complete write-off. There's no sense in which we are prepared. Even there isn't even, you know, you know that there's a green card. How many of you know there's a green card? It grants you permanent residency in the US. Does India have a green card? Does in, Is there any way that a foreigner can get permanent residency in India after working for a few years? <coughs> The answer is no, you can't. You just have to, if you wanted to, there are a few international faculty in IITs, they have to renew their visa every few years. And once in a while, some genius in some ministry will say, no, 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 you can't be renewed. Please go back now. By this time, the person has married. The person has children. The person has children in school in India. The person is now practically Indian except for their citizenship. <clears throat> but some wise person could say, no, no, your visa is no good. Go back. Now, OCI is a little better. It has slightly improved uh, the situation, actually, overseas citizen of India. But again, for that, you do, I think, have to marry an Indian. You can't just become OCI by supposing you're single and you come here, or supposing you're already a couple and you come here. Can you, by working here a few years, settle down here? You can't. Okay. And let's face it, in, in, there are enough tough things about living in India for a foreigner. On top of that, fighting with the government all the time is a no, is a no brainer. I mean, it's no, it's deal breaker. Nobody will do it. And by the way, people do it in China, which has a much more repressive system of and controlled system of government, but still it works. Somehow it works in China. Whole, whole labs pack up from Germany and move to China. I know people who have done it and who are living there. We haven't been able to do it. There's no will to do it. Actually, if anything, we hate foreigners. You see, we think foreigners is all white people. Foreigners is not all white people. Foreigners are black people, Arab people, Chinese people. We don't even give much respect to any of these people when they show their face in India in the first place. Sorry, and now it's I'm ranting a bit. <clears throat> but if they came and they were willing to put up with all that, at least academics would give them respect because in academic uh, campuses, they are always safe spaces, and they would at least adjust and the society would adjust also. You know, my building has a sign saying no renting to foreigners. I mean, we are pathetic with all that stuff. That's a fact. Uh, we go to the US or you will go to the US, so you won't like a sign saying no renting to foreigners, right? 
And these are cultural. I'm not blaming any particular government. These are cultural problems we have, but we haven't grown up from it. And no government in last many years has really tackled this issue. And India ain't becoming a science superpower anytime till we internationalize. And I thought ISA was going to be the um, path breaker for that. And it, it isn't. Okay, uh, that's the end of my story. And I'm sorry if I ranted a bit. And I'm sorry if I talk too much about myself. And uh, I'm sorry that you spent two hours listening to me. But anyway, I'm done. Uh, In the beginning of the talk, you said that you have a habit of speaking a lot. But we absolutely loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Great, okay. awesome. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you have more time, we can have a few audience questions. Oh, audience questions are most welcome. I'll be very happy. Sakhya, why don't you go ahead? Uh, hello. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so this is not really a question, but I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, something. It's just that like the time I was in ISER, I had always wanted, like we have had minor interactions through uh, uh, because of some event or anything, but I've never gotten to interact properly for a long, I mean, to, I always wanted, I was always curious about, you know, your story and all, and I heard a little bit from Palash and Rahul, all that, and this has been really, like, uh, I had, I was waiting for this, and uh, this was really uh, compensating for all that, and I feel like, okay, I didn't miss out on that, and also, like, a lot of things that you said are really validating about having, uh, you know, mentorship and not giving up, and then also the talking part, I hear that a lot, and I feel validated that, you know, you also, like, speaking yeah, I would just like end there if anybody else had questions. I just really wanted to thank you for like being thank so you. genuine and honestly, like, you know, talking like this is an informal talk, but like, it felt so one-on-one -on -one and personal. Thank you. Yeah, I think you brought up something which I forgot to say. You know, the single happiest thing about being in ISER for me is the student body. I've had all kinds of interactions, including some, uh, sorry to say, some fights also. When I was Dean of Student Activities, there was all kind of uh, unpleasantness about the cafeteria and all that. Mm -hmm. you, probably you don't know. Yeah. Hopefully you don't know. <laughs> and I was also a bit uh, inexperienced. but um, And I handled it badly, actually. But one-on-one um, -on -one or in groups, what I like about ISA students is as a body, you have a culture that you're pretty much ready for anything, ready to take on anything, ready to enjoy anything and ready to be yourselves. And I think you make that happen also to other people who are not like that when they join. Like mm. the difference between a person who joins ISER and the person, same person next year. I've seen it in so many people. Mm. It's just a huge difference. And it's a difference for the better in every way. They are more confident. They are more uh, ready to do stuff. And I've been to NICER, I've been to ISER, Bhopal, all good institutes. But only here, you know, 90 people would listen to a rubbish talk like this for two hours. I don't think anywhere else this kind of thing happens. Yeah. Uh, or organize it in the first place. Yeah, so this, actually, I'm really happy that they're organizing this. Also, we had been pitching something like this for two years when I was there and then Corona happened. And then we didn't even have a closing year, right? Like the fifth year, yeah. Cor yeah. And then we couldn't even come and back and show the gratitude to all of you. And yeah, like, I also want to say that, like, one, your second, the course you had taken for me in like second year and second year had been like it was so re re refreshing and so Thank nice you. I just wanted Thank to like you. tell all this yeah. I miss those moments you know after class when we would chat in the corridor yeah yeah uh, exactly it will yeah. come back I hope it comes back but some of you might have really lost uh, some time which won't come yeah. back but uh, some of for some of you it will come back yeah. <laughs> Yeah, at least your story shows that like be patient and not give up things, come back in some or some way or the other. See, today I didn't realize that my life was like this, that you know, every time things went well, they would break down again. Every single time. I mean, uh, I'm not going into it, but now, you know, I'm six months short of retirement. And even now, uh, there is some sense of feeling a bit stuck. And it's been going on for the last six months. So it's not, I'm not in a good place right now. But I know that, you know, eventually it will all work out. Yeah, and also for people who did not know you that place, like when CA and NRC was happening, there was like some eventful things there also. And like, I yeah. think people should know about that too. But like, if there is no time, people do go check up, ask your seniors about those stories as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I got in trouble also. <laughs>
with uh, bo- with board members okay i like that it's fun actually you know nobody knows how to really handle a difficult 65 year old you know <laughs> if you are a 20 year old student and being difficult they'll find you they'll suspend you and all but they really don't wouldn't know what to do with me so a lot of people just run run like hell when they see me because uh, they don't quite know what to do with this uh, <clears throat> rebellious person so yeah i like being rebellious it's uh, always been my nature could you tell us about that like <laughs> what rebellious uh, oh no what the zaki yeah, said basically na uh, i mean uh, no this is all recorded and live streamed i, I don't think i should go into it here uh, one on one i'll tell anybody anything i've told a lot of stories to people but uh, no not in a as it is i think i was pretty blunt you know you can go through this talk and figure out a lot of things i've said about people and figure out who the people are also i mean it's like i leave a lot of cues, uh, clues on the way so but uh, it's okay again what can they do it's a great feeling that way being 65 is great like what can they do sack me well i'll be sacked in 6 months anyway <clears throat> you know good luck can't do okay. anything so uh, why don't we stop the live stream and keep this exclusive mind <laughs> keep it uh, Look, I should go. I, no, anyway, I I don't think I don't think in a big forum. Yeah, okay, but I don't think in a big forum. I want to go into. You know, polit- politics is a tricky subject. You know, you all have your opinions. I may share some. I may not share others. And I should. I would like to respect you, whatever your opinions are. And you know, you are what all said and done. You are like forty years younger than me. So, and I have a potential that, in principle, I can you know bully you with my opinions. And I don't want to try that. so therefore i i still have got into that mistake many times but i'm not going to do it in a big uh, big group so i just think i shouldn't there is a yeah, also, you... you know when when my band used to say no to me there was a certain sense of them knowing very well who i was you know so you know it they knew that there are certain things they don't have to do and they got very comfortable with that and with the language which we used the first time you know some random you know in rock music rude language uh, does happen and the first time some four letter word showed up they all looked at me like oh we are saying it in front of sir and i was like please it's not the first time i'm hearing these words i, re- I have reached a certain age so i should know <clears throat> and they kind of got the point so yeah politics is not a very objective territory and um, yeah that's correct okay uh, area would you like to ask your question yeah yeah sure thank you sir for the two hours of absolute fun i enjoyed it a lot uh, i was just asking we were talking about culture and you were talking about the weird eccentricities of cambridge right uh, and like how although it is uh, fun on one side but at the end of the day they're all sad all drunk men but do you think those uh, small things those tiny things about gardens and fellows walking on grass do you think those like add some sort of character to an institute do you think they like they absolutely do you know like, do you think we should try to emulate that emulate you can't emulate i mean you can't you know, emulate it yeah. but do you think we should have some sort of culture of our own that is we, we should of course we should we should and actually we do i mean tifr has all kind of crazy cultures of its own and uh, i took on some of them and got into fights over some of them because some are a little outdated some are a little hierarchical some are meaningless um even in cambridge you know the friends i have i mean they show up in that high table for lunch wearing a t-shirt and jeans they don't care about dress code they are faculty there what can anyone do to them so and these old uh, drunk old men are glaring at them but they don't care so that's that so you know that's how um, life works there's always a pushback but uh, british have been masters at creating a mystique and a certain unique way of doing things and you know oxford cambridge the fact that they are so elite and so old I mean, look at it i mean being 5 600 years old is no joke 
Okay? Yeah. And uh, Trinity College has not, uh, and it was Trinity College was founded by like one of the leading leading murderers of history, Henry VIII. I mean, he 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 killed off all. I think uh, at least five, maybe all six of his wives. And I mean, had all of them killed off one after the other. I mean, there's not a more bloody man in history practically than that. And he founded Trinity College, all said and done. And he had his issues with the church. And so there was also a bit of jostling between royalty and church. And so those are all weird things. Now, they are weird things of, of their time. They were, okay, they were natural. But now to preserve all that, the high table is six inches higher than the rest of that dining hall. The students sit on the rest in the rest of the dining hall, and the professors and uh, <coughs> distinguished visitors, quote unquote, sit at this higher table, six inches higher, and get better food. Now, you know, I cannot. I mean, I cannot suggest that in ISER we should have one dining hall where I get better food and you people eat, uh, you know, worse food. Of course, the students' food is not bad in Trinity, but. There's just some. There's a bit of uh, too much story about you know this drama. I mean, it's. It's a drama which I would not have created, but since it's there and I was there, of course, I was happily eating that wonderful food. I mean, why shouldn't I? I mean, look at my friend Shiraz Minwala in TIFR. He was a Harvard Junior Fellow, and they have copied that culture in Harvard. Harvard Junior Fellow is like the most prestigious postdoc at Harvard, but it's a member of the Society of Fellows, and they have some fancy high table, and then there are senior Harvard Fellows, and many are Nobel laureates. But Shiraz Minwala decided that he's going to eat dinner with his hands. Nobody liked it, but he ate with his hands in all the years that he was a junior fellow, and now they still laugh about it. And even showed up for dinner wearing shorts. So, you know, that is him. So, you know, there these cultural things you cannot create. They get created by elites and then they get attacked by other people and it's a dy dynamic equilibrium. It's not static. Right. <clears throat> but suppose... having, having a museum, now, for example, they keep Isaac Newton's notebooks. So I got to go and see Isaac Newton's notebooks or go and see Ramanujan's notebooks. That is great. <clears throat> that you can always do, that we can do. Nobody's asked for my notebooks and then I'm not Ramanujam or Isaac Newton. <laughs> so what can I do? But, you know, uh, but but now the, the whole attitude here is, yeah, actually, we don't have anybody like that. So everybody's notebooks are worthless. I mean, that's not how it works. You have to have a culture of some respect for your seniors who, you know, it's not respect as not like bowing down to them, but rather trying to know what they did or what they contributed or what they achieved. That culture of respect is very good and we should have it. Right. I suppose these cultural things also have a bit of age to them, right? Like most of, like, I don't think they can just appear quickly. No, but for, yeah, certainly ISER is too young, but TIFR has an archive. Uh, TIFR has an archive where a lot of Homi Baba stuff is kept, but also more recent TIFR stuff right up until the present. Uh, important things are preserved there. Unfortunately, they lost two important things. One is the first computer ever made in India, Kitrak, which was dismantled and sold for junk. Nobody knows when and oh, where. Yeah. And the second was the first email ever sent in India. That was apparently lost with whatever computer. Not that computer, but the later computer. So that first okay. email is also lost. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, how many more questions can you take? Is it? Uh, in, in I, I can go on for another 10-15 minutes at most, maybe. Okay, then we can, our laptop, we can choose between people. Manu, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, hi. Uh, so I wanted to ask this seemingly politically incorrect question. Uh, please pardon me if it becomes factually incorrect too. But uh, something, a sort of a theme that I think we have observed in academia, at least in India throughout, that the uh, top tier institutes uh, and the say the senate of those or the uh, senior faculty in those tend to be so-called uh, upper castes. Mm. And and I, so you kind of belong to the, uh, you know, uh, first or second generation of the uh, academicians that India had. Um, since then, it has been maybe 20, 30 no, no, years. No, I don't belong to the first or second generation. I don't know what you think, but India, uh, IISC, TIFR started in 1945. <clears throat> 
so that okay. makes me about uh, counting 20 25 years as a generation i'm about fifth gen fourth generation or fifth yeah go okay. on uh, but still uh, starting from there to here i think it has been some 20 30 years of <clears throat> journey um, have you seen the caste landscape change uh, in the top tier institutes um, or maybe even in the student community how how do you see that change yeah so I'm happy to talk about that. So I have no insight into the student community, how it's working. Uh, as far as the faculty, <clears throat> I think, um, so there's an old approach to these problems and a new approach. Um, the old approach to these problems, which I'm glad to see that it's now out of date and it's no longer respectable is to say, no, no, we do not discriminate about caste or gender. If somebody is good, we will take them. As though somehow there is a favor in that. There's no favor in that. And there's also a lack of acknowledgement that people <coughs> of the uh, discriminated against caste or gender uh, or transgender people or LGBT people or whatever, actively find themselves find it difficult to compete from an early stage. So the few who have got anywhere have got somewhere by fighting against a lot of obstacles, <coughs> which have not been put in the path of other people. Until we recognize that fact, and which by the way, the Supreme Court said it better than me about two weeks ago, that uh, just saying merit, merit, merit doesn't really mean anything. It's just parroting some words. The fact is that there has to be a level playing field. That means it should be possible theoretically for a person from their date of birth onwards to shine and show their merit without being shut out because they are a woman or shut out because they are Dalit or because they are transgender or any other thing. So the new approach is at least we acknowledge that much and we see where we can go from there. I haven't personally been able to do better than that uh, for example, we do have a, uh, you know, a reser reserved category where we have been trying to hire faculty and it's very complicated because I would say some faculty I think are subconsciously casteist. Many faculty are not casteist, but they are sticking to that view that we don't need to do anything. The person needs to be good first, then only we'll do something. But if the person is good first, then we don't need to do anything either. If we need to do anything, it's when we need to make an active choice to make people <clears throat> able to compete and how it should be done, where it should start, at what age, what should be done, at which level and all. I'm not expert or qualified to say. All I can say is that uh, the pressure is rising on social media and in the media in general to be more sensitive about this issue and that's good on the other hand the backlash is also rising in the same media and it's going to happen and there's nothing you can i mean nothing you can do meaning you can't prevent it you can fight it you can oppose it and you should but uh, backlash on social media is a reality of life against everything every form of progress has its backlash I mean, Ashok Sen's computer led to a backlash in TIFR. The office staff declared that they are not going to use computers. And then two years later, when they were told that your typewriters are going away and you have to use computers, they kind of quietly buckled and agreed eventually. But there was a while they were fighting that idea. Uh, by the way, also gloriously, the CPM uh, party opposed computerization of India and Rajiv Gandhi's time. So, you know, these are some things where backlash comes from all kinds of people, maybe well-meaning, maybe not well-meaning, we don't know. But uh, it's a dynamic. And uh, all I can say is the more people <clears throat> understand the issue properly and believe in social justice, the more things will go forward. Otherwise, they'll go backward, but eventually they're going to go forward anyway. By the way, I'll give you one proof that things are going to go forward anyway. Until 10 years ago in the US, uh, or even six or seven years ago, the issue of LGBTQ plus people in the US was hotly debated with Republicans being totally against gay, transgender, lesbian, everything they could think of. And now the entire Republican Party has given that up. It's no longer an issue and all gay people and transgender and everybody is welcome and they all have rights and they can all get married. And the issue has kind of 
died. At an individual level, there is discrimination, but on the legal side, the issue has totally died. LGBTQIA plus now is a completely approved uh, thing in the US from all sides of the political spectrum, including conservatives. How did that happen? It just finally happened. Progress only works in one way. It's a sort of the arrow of time. So caste and gender discrimination will go. There's no question about it. It can't be stopped. Question is only how much time it will take and how many people will suffer in that time. So there, I said something political now. Like it or don't like it. Um, I guess uh, Amok raised his hand earlier. Amok, do you ask? Uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you, sir, for the amazing talk. It was very fun to listen to you talk. Thank you. Uh, sir, so like my question is about uh, the areas that you work on, right? Theoretical physics, especially string, string theory. It doesn't really pertain to anything directly applicable to the society. We are not, uh, in a some sense, giving back to the society. So have you ever felt the need to justify to yourself like why you are working on this field rather than say something else which might be directly applicable? Yeah. Uh, and uh, the way I justify it is by the story of Mr. Um, von Röntgen. Uh, in 1905 or thereabouts, every medical professional, yeah, the guy who discovered X-rays, every medical professional in Europe was trying to find how we should help society by treating soldiers. Because, you know, 20th century was a century of war. And there was a big war going on in the early 20th century in South Africa, the Boer War. And soldiers were going there fighting and coming back with bullet wounds. And they didn't know what to do and how to get those uh, soldiers uh, operated properly to recover because they didn't know where the bullet is lodged in the body. And uh, I've told this talk, many many of you may have heard this talk in, in my, my other talks. They, the medical professionals were inventing instruments made out of some combination of materials, metal and uh, glass, which would be poked into places where the soldier had a wound and then moved around to, to see whether inside at the end of that wound is a bone or a piece of bullet. Because the feeling of the probe scraping on a bullet or scraping on bone is different. They were trying to magnify. Yeah, I know some of you are looking very distressed. It would be like the most painful thing. As it is, you got shot on top of that, that some surgeon is poking something into your body looking for bullets. Now, what I'm trying to say is, all the smart money and the applied science was on these bullet probes. Somebody even had the probe connected to a telephone so that in the receiver, you can hear that scraping sound louder so that you can know with, but it was still a scraping sound on a damn bullet inside that pers living person's body. And this guy tinkering in his lab solved the problem in one year without having any interest in medicine whatsoever. Okay, because after that, you just needed to look through the body and you could see the bullet and that was that. X-ray was used from the very next year in uh, for soldiers. Now, uh, you probably think that's a one-off and that's over and it's never happening again. And I don't think so. When it will happen, how it will happen, I can't say. I probably won't be the one doing it. It probably won't come out of my work on conformal field theory in two dimensions, but it could. The point, though, is that creating that atmosphere with a small fraction <coughs> of the funds spent on society has the potential to benefit large numbers of people in ways which are completely new. And everything which is benefiting us now is from the quantum era, which, again, the entire quantum era was anti-society, uh, pure elite, uh, research in labs with no, I mean, okay, you may say that, well, soon, you know, radiation and nuclear uh, energy and all came out, but suppose it hadn't. Still, today, you know, I saw a James Bond movie the other day, they're talking of smart blood, which is like nanobots injected into you so that people can track you on GPS wherever you are through your blood. I mean, crazy. And of course, it's James Bond. But you know, the fact that you can talk about these crazy things now, and I mean, there are a lot of nano things which actually are true, and you can do them. And everybody thinks, yeah, it's perfectly natural for the computing power of, uh, you know, all of uh, 2000 Ashok Sen's computers of that age 
to be in something the size of my fingernail. It's not natural. It happened because of quantum mechanics uh, and um, in principle ideas in physics, not practice, not the attempt. Nobody started saying, well, we are going to do quantum mechanics so that we can make a computer chip. Nobody thought of that. So I justified to myself saying that fundamental science serves a purpose and it can only happen in an ecosystem. It's not me. I'm not von Röntgen. But even in those days, there was an ecosystem. When he did his work, there were a few hundred people in Europe who could understand it, who could take it forward, who could develop it. Okay. And there were people who were reacting with interest to what he was doing. If we don't have that kind of trained people, this isn't going to happen. So yeah, I could work on society and I could uh, you know, hope to make a better uh, heart, heart rate monitor or oxygen saturation monitor or something for people with COVID. But then at the end of it, th we are using up all the old ideas and we're not putting any new ones. All the old ideas are being just used up. We are simply... Paris, this generation is parasites on the inventors of quantum mechanics and the computer chip. What has your generation invented, which is new knowledge for society? You're just applying old knowledge, right? I'm just, I'm putting it in a very loaded way. And obviously I don't believe everything I said, but it's just trying to say that, yes, uh, <clears throat> Putting new ideas into society is the best thing you can do. It will give 100 years or 500 years, not one year of benefit. But we can't, the price we pay, we can't really say where it will benefit. <clears throat> Chalo, I should start. Thank you, sir. Up, but yeah, let yeah, me have uh, these quick questions from Soham and uh, Amir. Uh, so, uh, do you have the time to take those last two questions? Yeah, yeah two questions I can yeah. take and then we'll stop. Yeah, go ahead, Soham. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, it was a very nice session. I enjoyed it. Uh, my question is, uh, the, you talked about the bitter competition uh, you had to face. So is that something uh, that uh, everyone faces or is it something specific? You, uh, I think everyone faces to some degree. I might have faced it a little... Uh, two times I faced it. One time, I think in TIFR, I really feel it was very unnecessary. Uh, and I hope other people don't face it. But uh, the one I faced in Stony Brook was more or less normal, I think, that graduate students, especially in the West, are very competitive. And uh, they're also trying hard to impress. You know, you have a few professors. They'll take the student who impresses them. Mm -hmm. If you, as a PhD student, go there very shyly and say, yeah, I'm a nice boy. I do this, a nice girl. I do this, this. It's okay. Well, you can say, I'm confused about this. You're very honest. But professor will be, ah, this one is confused. That one is talking with confidence. I'll take that one. So somewhere your uh, competitive, your competitors are going to use that self-confidence against you. So just be prepared. I don't say that go to their level, but at least be prepared. Don't be so bhola like I was. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Okay, uh, and the last question today, Amaya. Yes, sir, it was a very wonderful session and it was a very honest session. Thank you so much. My question is that, uh, you know, just uh, brief about the timelines of these institutes, like, uh, like when was Harish Chandra created, when was IMSC created, the NCBS, ICTS, who went out and okay. how it was. Okay. Like, okay. Uh, okay, I'll tell you. TIFR was founded in 1945 by Homi Bhava, Pandit Nehru and J.R.D. Tata tripartite agreement signed between government of India, uh, 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 government of Bombay, state uh, presidency as it was then, and Tata's company. Um, Institute of Science Bangalore was founded before that, and it was called Tata Institute. Actually, it was founded by J. N. Tata much earlier. I can't give you the dates, but it's much earlier. Uh, um, IIT uh, Bombay and uh, the old IITs, IIT Bombay, Madras, Delhi, Kharagpur and Kanpur were all started in the 1960s and they were the first five IITs, I think all together, essentially in Pandit Nehru's time. Uh, then there was a long gap and then a whole bunch of IITs have been started in the last 15 years to cope with the demo new demographic and the you know, the change in the economic status of the country, which has been coming since at least 20, 25 years now. Uh, HRI started as MRI, Mehta Research Institute. It was a little quiet institute in Allahabad. 
working out of a judge's uh, retired judge's house for some reason rented or something and i visited there and then it was taken over by dae probably in the 19 uh, early 1990s and <clears throat> its name changed to harish chandra research institute and so it has been what it is uh, basically since the mid 1990s or so and they got their campus in jusi which is a gorgeous campus with peacocks and everything and uh, yeah uh, math science was founded by alladi ramakrishnan uh, quite early i think it uh, i don't know the dates you can look it up but um, probably after tifr but much again it was not a dae institute so i think these institutes were one by one taken over by dae at the certain stages department of atomic energy so math science and hr is like that now tifr has had centers so tifr has a center called ncra in pune national center for radio astrophysics <clears throat> and these were outgrowths of tifr's desire to set up dedicated centers in certain limited areas like this center only does radio astrophysics which is you know not all of physics and certainly not all of science unlike tifr similarly ncbs bangalore that was set up by obed siddiqui uh again i think in the 90s or 80s uh, or 90s i'm trying to remember i know that the buildings were coming up by mid 90s so maybe it started in early 90s uh on the other hand uh, icts is much more recent i think the campus has only been functional for maybe 7 8 years as far as i can remember uh strings 2015 was held there and it was not campus was not <coughs> yet complete it was uh, very partially built so 6 7 8 years 7 years uh yeah that's what i know icers uh, two were started together pune and kolkata about 50, about 16 17 16 years ago maybe i can't remember the date maybe 2008 or thereabouts um or maybe earlier and then after that three more came kolkata mohali and bhopal and trivandrum sorry four more i don't remember in which order and then barhampur and there was talk of one in nagaland but it never happened i think and uh, that's what i know and nicer was set up at the same time as the icers it has the same ideology but it's funded by dae rather than ministry of education and actually nicer has a lot of money unlike icers yeah on that note uh thank you so much once again professor sin like the talk was uh, i think genuinely invaluable in terms of like both perspective and honesty and even if like uh, even if it isn't immediately beneficial i think uh, considering that we are a science institute and a lot of people who will be going into academia and even if they don't as well i think the perspective would be uh, very invaluable later down the line as well so once again thank you so much for uh, taking the time out to do this and uh, being so honest and open in this talk can well thank you guys for being a, such a great audience i don't have that many you know uh, occasions to keep talking like this about myself so it was a lot of fun and uh, your questions were great and your interactions were great so thanks again hmm? yeah so can i ask okay. more yeah. question uh, can i ask a question uh, i have one more question yeah. uh, uh, sir actually i was a little bit uh, confused or you can say demotivated by like uh, looking at acam this debate academia whether you want to go to academia or not this debate so uh, like I, in your story also i have seen that there were some points where uh, luck was very much involved like you have to meet someone otherwise there was very like we don't know what would have happened yes. and also like everyone stories there is something and also there are very very much stories that i am hearing nowadays that lot of brilliant people are leaving academia for lot of reasons including politics and all these fund related things uh, this all feel uh, feels a little demotivating demotivating to me for sometimes uh, i wanted to know you take on pushkar that's a very good question it does feel demotivating and one has to you know one has to uh, approach it carefully for example <clears throat> you want financial security everyone wants financial security that's something you should keep in mind and you should weigh your risks but you should also weigh that how much staying power you have as a person can you stay through difficult times <coughs> with some faith in yourself that things will come out do you have a basic optimism if you do have that no amount of politics or anything is going to 
block you. Nobody who is really motivated can be blocked. The system won't block. I mean, even uh, what when I say ISER, you know, doesn't have that kind of uh, funding and all that, it will get again. It will do well again. It's doing okay. It's managing with what it has. So, you know, not, anything which doesn't want to stop is not going to stop. That I can tell you. And we are not at the stage where actually anybody wants to shut down this enterprise in India as yet. And I hope it never comes to that. Uh, and I think that when people argue about benefits to society, you should be aware that for every five, you know, five or six ISERs, there are literally many hundred government institutes that you haven't heard of. There's a SALT Research Institute. Did you know there's a SALT Research Institute? Well, it's working on SALT. Guess what? That's their job. Okay, that's why ISA doesn't have to work on SALT. It's not like nobody is working on it. Somebody is working on it. There's an institute for it. There are institutions for sanitation. There are institutes for agriculture. There are institutes for habitat. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of such institutes, which we never hear about. So don't get distracted by the idea that we have to suddenly do all those things. Those institutes are there and they are doing those things. I've talked to some really expert young agriculturists who are doing innovative work in an institute for agriculture. So we have a certain mission and that is to do academics at this stage and then do something which uses academics. It could be, you could be a journalist, you could be a science advisor, you could, uh, <clears throat> you could be a, a, a science manager, you could be a, a school teacher or a college teacher, you could be a researcher. There are lots of different things you can, can be with this training. You can be a philosopher of science. That's another kind of academic. So there are many things we can do. But you have to not get discouraged because there will be hurdles. Chalo. So I, I think why don't you stop the recording now and then uh, I'll leave. Uh, yeah, on that note, thank you so much for like thank you guys. Uh, taking thank the time out and then you can staying ahead for all these questions as well. Yeah. Uh, I guess we'll be ending the meeting now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. And thank you, Professor Mokhi. This was wonderful. Yeah, and thank you to the audience as well for attending.